You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to the Common Descent Podcast. This is episode 135. Wait, that ends in a five. It sure does, and you know what that means? Plants. Allie! Allie's here to talk with us about plants. This episode's topic, just in time for the start of spring, is seeds. We are going to talk about what seeds are, what the function of seeds are, and how we study seed evolution and fossil history. Seeds are very important for the fossil record. So it's going to be a very fun discussion about the paleontology and evolution perspective on seeds. Yeah. And yes, of course, as usual, these days, for our episodes that end in five tradition, we will be joined for our plant discussion by our friend Dr. Ali Baumgartner. After the news, which is after the announcements... And not only is it a plant episode and an appropriate spring topic, but this subject was requested, as all our subjects are. Seeds as a topic was suggested by Samuel, Arturo, Mark, and Science Skink. Good suggestion. Thanks, everybody. Before we get into the main topic, a few announcements. Announcement number one, we have a Patreon. We do. The support we receive from our patrons keeps the podcast going not only like morally and deep within our hearts, but also financially. The support from our patrons funds everything we do with the podcast. Yeah, also literally. Also literally, yes. <laughs> actually, physically, we stand upon the piles of support. <laughs> patrons get all sorts of bonus goodies like bonus content, and we do live streams for our patrons. But one of the rewards you can get at a certain level is that we will thank you personally on the podcast. This episode, we would like to welcome and thank new patrons, Eric and Daniel. Welcome. Thank you so much for your support. Thanks for joining us. Hey, dear listener, if you would like to support the podcast and our science education efforts as well, feel free to join us on Patreon and explore a bunch of the bonus content that you can get. There's some neat stuff up there, especially right now. Speaking of additional ways to support or engage with the podcast and the community, we recently celebrated our five-year anniversary of the podcast, and along with that, we launched a Discord server. It's been going great, so if you want to join the Discord community, you can find that link in the episode description. You can also find our social media links there and our Patreon links there. And the link to our Zazzle store, where we have a bunch of cool merch where you can get our logo and other artwork. And we've got a bunch of artwork that we recently announced for the five-year anniversary. Some really cool stuff, some serious paleo art stuff, and some more cartoony fun stuff. Check it out. And while we're talking about art, by the time this episode comes out, we will also have released a special episode of a conversation with Rob Soto, who has done a bunch of the art for us. Yes. So if you'd like to listen into our deep dive into our paleo artist friend and the process that we've gone through to commission and create art with him, check that episode out. It was a lot of fun to chat with Rob. Yeah, it was very interesting to get kind of the in-depth look at this process from an artist's perspective yeah so check it out we hope you enjoy it and without further ado it is time for the news news every episode we include a news section where we talk about some of the new research that has been bouncing around the news cycles in paleontology evolution and so on will please begin the news with some news don't mind if i do This first bit of news is about a very old potential relative of octopus. Oh, for a second I thought you were going to say a very old potato, and I was more (laughs) excited than I expected to be. But all right, octopus, that's even better. (laughs) How old is this spud? (laughs) So moldy you wouldn't believe it. (laughs) This is a very well-preserved fossil of what seems to be an ancient relative of The group that includes octopus today, maybe. So if it is, it would have some very interesting implications for the group. This is research by Christopher Wallen and Neil Landman in Nature Communications. And the article is by Anna Gibbs in Science News. This new fossil has been named Silipsimopodi bidenii and is estimated to be about 330 million years old. So from the Carboniferous. Okay. And is very well preserved. It's got the long body 
and ten arms visible in the fossil. All right. Ten arms, not what we expect from an octopus, no. but from many of their relatives. Yes, that is the ancestral state of our modern groups of cephalopods. That's why squids still have ten arms. Octopus have reduced to eight. This was discovered in Montana's Bear Gulch limestone. So a few things here. One, preserved cephalopod, which is unusual because they are soft-bodied creatures. So that's exciting in and of itself. Uh, It is very old. And according to the current analysis of this research, it looks like it may be part of a group known as the vampiropods. Vampire squids? Yes, this is the group that includes vampire squids and octopuses. They are both in this overall group. They are close cousins to each other. Yeah, not true vampires, which is why they were not mentioned last episode. Yes, exactly. (laughs) If this is true, if it is a vampiropod, it would be the oldest ancestor to modern octopuses by more than 80 million years. Wow. To the next fossil. Yeah. So it pushes back the dates on this group way further if it is accurate. And that does corroborate with some molecular clock estimates. So estimates based off of the DNA and evolutionary uh, rates would date similarly with this fossil. Right. We would expect these ancestors to have been around by this time. Exactly. So that's not too far-fetched based off of that. This classification is mainly focused on or, or based off of the fossil having a feature known as a gladius which is an internal structure in many cephalopods shaped like the Roman sword, the gladius. Got it. <laughs> it is a internal support. Uh, this is okay. runs down the body. It's kind of, think of kind of like the cuttlefish's cuttle bone or how the squids have their internal little cartilage, not quite shell, but support. This is a structure like that to give some support. They're not quite as floppy as our octopuses today. In this fossil, you can identify... Very slight, thin growth lines along the edge that seem to be the rib-like parts of this structure, this support structure. This would all give us some potentially very interesting information to work with and somewhat contradict a lot of previously held thoughts about octopus evolution and the overall vampiropod group. The common held hypothesis is that this group evolved from or descended from the Triassic Phragmotuthid belemnoids, and we mentioned belemnites in our cephalopods episode. Episode 16. Superficially look like squid, but with like a bony pin cap at the tip of their mantle. Yes. Sort of bullet-shaped. Uh, I remember seeing a discussion online about trying to find analogies to use that weren't... Uh, uh, ballistic. I mean, ballistic-related, <laughs> you know? Lawn that's dart. Rocket-shaped, well, bullet-shaped, well, I mean, that, but that's what the shape is. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very uh, projectile-esque structure. (laughs) And this would strongly challenge that hypothesis. This is well before the Triassic. So if if this is an accurate uh, uh, identification, then that sure doesn't seem like it can be the case. It also, as you noted earlier, possesses 10, as they put, robust arms with suckers visible. Cool. This would make it the only known vampiropod to retain the ancestral tin-arm body plan. That, along with an elongated mantle and terminal fins at the end, Mm. means that this would actually look very superficially squid-like. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Mm Mm-hmm. So it, it looks very much like what you think of as a squid, but is not actually a squid it's got just enough features to link it with the octopus lineage yep 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 and this is not the first time like the vampire squid Mm -hmm. is also not a squid (laughs) (laughs) right they even said that two a pair of the arms may be elongated like in squids but that seemed Um, like it was a eh, we're not sure but and this is why i've been very careful with my word choice to say if there are researchers who very much disagree with this classification Mm. and identification because they do not think that gladius is a gladius. One researcher, uh, Christian Klug, was quoted as saying that it does not look like a gladius to them. To them, it looks like a flattened phragmacone, which is the chambered structure 
of the shells of early cephalopods. Oh. It doesn't look like the rib-like gladius. It looks like a shell that has been flattened, which would make it one of the early shelled groups not ancestral to our modern vampire and octopuses. So that's why the paper said at one point that it hinges on that identification of the gladius. Right. So far, it seems that there's still some identification that needs to be done with this fossil. But if it is a gladius, it would be huge for the evolutionary studies of the vampiropod group. You gotta love a group like octopuses, where every new fossil is a major discovery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because there's just so few of them that any time you find one, it's important information. Exactly. That this is something we haven't seen before almost by definition because they're just so rare with their soft bodies. This also is a really interesting demonstration of how hard it can be to identify, especially when you get back into ancestral groups that tend to have things in common with a lot of the descendants and other cousins that sometimes identification can really come down to some particular specific features which really need to be shored up to make the evolutionary inf inferences that you're trying to make. Well, and this is where things like convergent evolution can really mm. muddy the waters, because both of the things that they think that one feature looks like are structural support for the body. Right. Just two very different kinds of structural support. Which is interesting, because it sounds like there is discussion about, okay, is this this group or is this this group? And either way, it's going to be a cool find. Oh, yeah. No, this is an amazingly well-preserved cephalopod. Either way, that tells us cool new stuff <laughs> about fossilization and about the evolution of this group. We're just not sure which way it's going to go yet. Yeah. Wonderful. Hey, if you want to hear more about cephalopods, that's episode 16, and <laughs> Convergent Evolution is episode 70. Well, while we're on the note of very old relatives of weird modern groups... I've got a bit of news about an ancient cousin of Tuataras. That is very old and very weird. Very old and very weird. Cool. This is research by Tiago Samoas, Grace Kinney Broderick, and Stephanie Pierce in Communications Biology. And we will link to an article in Cosmos in the blog post. All these articles are linked in the blog post after the episode. This one in Cosmos, uh, an article by Emma Perfetto. There is a group of reptiles called Sphenodontians. They are very closely related to lizards and snakes, lepidosaurs, but they are not quite in that group. Today, the group Sphenodontians includes one species, the Tuatara in the genus Sphenodon, which is a very lizard-like animal uh, that's found in New Zealand. Though they are rare today, the fossil record of Sphenodontians goes back at least 230 million years to the early Triassic, and studies have indicated, estimated a split from Lepidosaurs, that their ancestors diverged in the late Permian around 260 million years ago. And, really interestingly, during the Triassic period, Sphenodontians were very widespread and diverse. Ancient Sphenodontians have been found in North America, South America, Europe, and Africa during the Triassic. In fact, back at that time, they were more widespread and diverse than Lepidosaurs than the ancient cousins and ancestors of lizards and snakes. How the turns table. And they tabled in the Cretaceous. During the Cretaceous, it sort of flipped, and Lepidosaurs became the more common group, which has persisted to today, where the numbers are about 11,000 to 1 in terms <laughs> of species of squamates versus the Tuatars. <laughs> this, is like, this is like when you play checkers with <laughs> your young sibling or cousin. And you get to the point of like, all right, well, I've got eight kings and you have yep. one piece left. It's your move. Yep. But just, <laughs> just kill them. <laughs> uh, but don't, no, leave the two Yeah, no, no, no. no. These are awesome. <laughs> we don't want to. So we know that uh, two Ataras and their groups, Venodontians, have a fascinating history, but we don't have a very good fossil record, especially of the group Sphenodontines which is the group that includes modern Tuataras. This study describes a new species from the early Jurassic of Arizona, around 190 million years old. The remains are actually really nice. It is a nearly complete articulated skeleton, which I'm showing Will now some of the images of it. It is a really nicely preserved fossil skeleton of this ancient animal. 
Very neat. Along with dozens of upper and lower jaws from the same species. Oh. So we actually have a very good vision of this species. And not only a great view of the skeleton, but the most complete age series, ontogenetic age series from young to old individuals in all Sphenodontian fossils. That's so odd. I, man, growth series. They make me so happy. Very cool. Ontogeny episode 33. They named the new species Navajo Sphenodon sani. It is a new genus and new species. Navajo Sphenodon. Navajo named for the Navajo Native Americans. Sphenodon is the genus of modern Tuataras. And sani means old age in Navajo. That's awesome. That's such a cool name. It is a very, a very cool name. Also, such a weird juxtaposition for modern stuff of Tuataras with Native Americans. Yeah. Yep. What, a, what a weird uh, combination. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing that's really most interesting about this new find, according to the researchers, is that a lot of the features in Navajo Sphenodon, including parts of the skull, the skeleton, and even how they changed as they grew, are very similar to modern Tuataras. Oh. Which is interesting because other ancient Sphenodontians were more diverse and widespread. They point out that this 190 million year old species is more like modern Tuataras than either of them is like many other ancient Sphenodontians. Huh. And that other ancient Sphenodontians were to each other. Huh. Which suggests that, for one thing, the skeletal features we see in modern Tuataras have a very deep history, and that some of the features of their skeleton have been important for a long time. Yeah. So one example they gave in the paper was adaptations in the skull for strong bite, that those adaptations seemingly were important in the Jurassic period and are still important for that lineage today. And combining this evidence with other recent studies that have indicated slow rates of evolution for Tuataras, there have been DNA studies and skeletal studies that have indicated that they haven't changed very quickly or very dramatically in their sort of recent evolutionary history and long-term evolutionary history, altogether suggests, and this is how they phrased it in the paper, a remarkable degree of stabilizing selection and morphological conservatism. Cool. Altogether meaning that Sphenodontians are a group that was once very widespread, and the one lineage we still have has retained a bunch of similar features that some of the earlier ones had that we don't have. So we've talked about uh, like sloths. Yes. Where there were all all this diversity and then the only ones we have left are weird ones that are very different from classic when we think of ground sloths, episode 24. This feels a lot more to me like crocs. Yes. Where crocs were much more diverse and widespread in the past, but it seems like there's always been among all the diversity there have always been croc shaped crocs yes exactly and our modern crocs happen to be a group that also retains that very common structure throughout time and those phrases they used stabilizing selection indicates that the evolutionary pressures to ataras have been under because there's always evolution happening it's not like they stopped evolving but that they have been under selective pressure to retain these important features instead of changing them dramatically like in certain other lineages. And morphological conservatism just means that they've held on to ancestral features. Yes. So, whereas with the octopus, octopuses have lost that internal shell and some of the extra arms that their ancestors have, there was selection that something was beneficial about making those changes. With Tuataras, what it looks like we're seeing is that the benefit that drove their evolution was not making major changes. Yeah, well, because it's very easy to get caught up in the idea that if you're evolving, you're always evolving to be more efficient, to be more ideally adapted to whatever situation you're in. But there's plenty of situations where if you're surviving perfectly well enough, you're doing good enough and and there's not really anything that's giving you trouble, then 
staying at that level of good enough mm -hmm. might be your ideal survival strategy, long term even. Oh, yeah. Or it could even be that anything else you might adapt for, this species might adapt for in the future, has severe competition. Yes. Yep. Or you're not in a good habitat for it. So the most beneficial thing, the the best long-term strategy through natural selection is not to make major changes. Yep. We discussed a lot of these concepts much more in episode 90, which was our episode on living fossils, of mm. which the Tuatara, that is a title often thrown at Tuataras, just like it is at Crocs. Yup. Very cool. It, the Tuataras are such a, a fascinating group because they're... They're an oddity, not because they're super strange, but just because they're very normal looking. Yeah, they look like lizards. They look like a lizard. So then when you find out that they're not a lizard, that makes it extra weird. Yeah. <laughs> so they're weird because they're not weird, yep. almost. <laughs> and not only do they look like lizards, the paper actually discussed that some of these features of early sphenodontines are also expected features of early lepidosaurs. Because that is back in a time where they were much more similar during their uh, uh, shortly after their ancestral split. So the Tuatara, in some ways, not only looks like a lizard; it looks like the archetypal lizard. Yeah, yeah. But like you have a bunch of these ancestral features from early on before either group really diversified. So you have held on to this general body shape that is as classic as it gets <laughs> for this group of reptiles. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Well, speaking about odd ancestral features, this next bit of research was looking at the evolution of... Now, the way it was often titled was the evolution of galloping, but specifically asymmetrical movement, which includes things like the gallop. Oh. This is research by Eric McElroy and Michael Granitowski in the Journal of Experimental Biology, and the article is a press release from phys.org uh, by the Company of Biologists. <laughs> cool right <laughs> biology co <laughs> big biology so the gallop and similar type movements are categorized in something known as asymmetrical gates asymmetric movement basically when you think of a gallop versus us running when we run it's left right left right left right it's very metronome-esque mm -hmm. it's even pacing with a gallop it's da -da 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 -dum, da -da 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 -dum. That it is the feet are not hitting at a symmetrical pace. Okay. That's the difference between some... Our running is symmetrical. When a horse trots and it's... Right. That's symmetrical. But when the pattern of footfalls isn't regular... When it's not way. symmetrical on both sides. Mm, gotcha, Left gotcha. and right. That's the key. Because asymmetric gates also include things like bounding. Like a rabbit's hopping. Okay. Is asymmetrical because it's not there's not a symmetric regular pattern the specific definition is that all asymmetric gates are ones where the timing of footfalls is unevenly spread left and right timings are not evenly spaced okay it's i, I had some trouble definitely being able to categorize a gate that i could think of mm -hmm. into one or the other based off of this but this includes things like gallops bounding things called crutching which is something that uh, many amphibious fish will do, where they pull themselves across land with their fins. Or punting, when fish uh, move along the sea or water floor with their pectoral fins. Okay. Part of the thing that makes those things asymmetrical is that the front feet are doing stuff, but the back feet aren't. Right. You've got a difference in what your pairs of limbs are doing. Yes. And this is just notable because it means that there is an independent coordination between the limbs. Right. I was just about to say, it means you can't just set all your limbs to do exactly the same movement. Yes. It's not like if you have a toy and all four limbs are operating on the same movement of a motor or something, so they're all doing exactly the same thing because that's easy to program and create. Yes. This is, you have multiple limbs operating independently and acting out of sync with each other exactly so like if you think about the way a lizard walks where it's the front right and the back left moving forward and then the front left and the back right moving forward that's still symmetrical because they're just 
alternating, but they are doing the exact same motion. Mm -hmm. Both sides, it's symmetrical with the timing and spacing of the gait. Traditionally, quite often, it has been thought that these kinds of ways of moving around are mammalian. Mm -hmm. You know, that they are, that they really were a thing for mammals. Uh, Even though gave some fish examples, the old idea was that, yeah, galloping and bounding is things that mammals do. Which would have meant that this showed up just a bit more than 200 million years ago when mammals showed up. But we have some fish examples already. Crocodiles are also known Mm -hmm. to do a form of galloping. And turtles are known to bound, to kind of hop when they're trying to move fast. Mm -hmm. Which means it is not mammalian. We see these asymmetrical gates in multiple groups. So the question is, you know, is there, what is the evolutionary history of this kind of movement? Right. In these various groups and across Animalia. Yeah, because understanding how movement and locomotion has evolved over time is really important for understanding lifestyles of different groups of life. Absolutely. They went through the literature and looked at a bunch of different groups. Uh, Their sample size ended up being about 308 species. Cool. They were looking at extant nathosomes, which means... Us with mouths. Mm -hmm. Jawedfish and beyond. Yep. And we're looking for signs of the evidence in the literature of symmetrical or asymmetrical gates. Uh, They scored them. Zero if all of their walking was evenly timed. And one if it showed signs of asymmetrical moving. And then used that scoring system to then to try to model potential evolutionary histories. Right. And they had some preconceived models that they were applying it to to see if it, which ones fit. Right. And we've talked about this in other news in the past, where we will look at features of living animals and look at the distribution of those features and then estimate what the evolutionary history of those features must be given our understanding of the relationships in deep time between those species. Exactly. And surprisingly... The model that seemed to best fit the data was that asymmetrical gates are ancestral to pretty much all animals. Oh, interesting. And would have showed up around 472 million years ago. Wow. So basically everything, including us and fish, seems that it should be ancestral to that whole side, that whole branch of animal life. Wow. So not just mammals. Not just mammals, <laughs> which means a few things. Now, it's it's not necessarily saying that they were doing the same movements as today's animals. It may have been proto-asymmetrical. Sure. Yeah, slightly asymmetric. Not fully any of the gates that we see in today's you know walking fish or today's you know land animals walking around. But it does seem to indicate that our earliest ancestors had some of had the potential for this gate. Which is interesting also because it would have been way before we came on land. Mm -hmm. Even just fish that were using their fins to move around underwater, way before they were ever coming toward land, likely had the potential for these kinds of movements. And then since then, it's very likely that it was lost in the groups that don't show it. uh, And could have been regained in other groups. Mm -hmm. So we don't know for sure they were not able to reconstruct for each individual lineage. So like crocs and turtles, whether they were ancestrally able to gallop and bound, they weren't able to determine that based off this research. Uh, But since there are groups today that seem to lack the ability, you know, that at least demonstrated it, at least don't demonstrate it and have physical attributes that don't lend themselves to this kind of movement, it seems that it was lost in many groups such as lizards and salamanders and things like that. Mm -hmm. Snakes. Snakes, that's very true. (laughs) Uh, They they also noted uh, elephants Mm -hmm. just walk. They can't gallop. Yep. And so it could be that it is ancestral for certain groups. You know, it continued to be ancestral for, like, mammalia. Likely, ancestrally, could move the way mammals move today, while other groups may have lost it in their ancestors. So, like, amphibians may never have had that ability evolved into their group. It was lost before they branched off. And so they would have had to re-evolve it to be able to start galloping or something. 
And the reasons this could be lost is just could be as simple as it's just not necessary. You're not moving quickly enough to need to go asymmetric because a lot of the asymmetrical gates are the fast moving ones. Galloping and bounding are when you're trying to move quickly. Uh, or it could be that there's some neuromuscular limitation that's mm. making it difficult for your group to achieve that motion. Right. Your body shape or body structure just isn't very conducive to that. Yeah, you're not quite wired for it. I like discoveries like this, especially the idea that this is something that is much more ancestral, something that evolved much earlier on than we thought, because that's always a lovely defiance of expectation, mm -hmm. because it's so easy, and scientists have fallen into this pitfall all throughout the history of studying life on Earth, to assume that the efficient or often referred to as advanced mm -hmm ways of living must be more recent or must be more specific to certain groups. But there are so many examples of that, as we've talked about in other newses, where we discover that no fish were able to do that. We just, it just wasn't as obvious to us right away. Yes. And this is yet another example of what we talked about in episode 77, about how a lot of the things that ended up being useful for walking around on land were already present in fish beforehand. Yeah. That fish evolved a lot of the tools they needed for getting around on land before they applied them to actually getting around on land. Yeah, before they even started messing around with the shore. Yep. Well, and the part of what blew me away with this is that I never would have thought to look into the evolutionary history of a, a particular kind of motion across vastly unrelated groups. Mm -hmm. Like... To me, I would have just been like, oh, it's, 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 some can move that way sometimes. It didn't seem like something that would, where ancestry would be as important. Well, as it turns out, I also have a news about locomotion and gates in ancient animals. Cool. Uh, this one is not across vast groups, but specifically estimating the way that sauropod dinosaurs walked. <gasps> Ooh, very good stuff. This is research by Jens Lallensack and Peter Falkingham in the journal Current Biology, and in the blog post we will link to an article in the conversation by the same authors. Sauropod dinosaurs, of course, the long-necked, long-tailed, four-legged dinosaurs that include your brachiosaurs and apatosaurs and so on, episode 101. Sauropods are famously gigantic and famously quadrupedal. They walk on four legs. Now, there has been lots of research investigating the motion of ancient dinosaurs and how they walked. But apparently, estimating quadrupedal gaits, walking styles, in ancient animals is considered very difficult. Now, part of this is because there is so much variation in gait, in how they walk. Uh, for a few examples that the authors describe, some animals use lateral couplets when they walk, which means both left feet move and then both right feet move. Like camels, I think, do that. Yep, camels do that. And others use diagonal couplets, where the front left and back right move, and then the other diagonal. Uh, my cat walks like this. Yeah, a, a lot of your mammals you know, walk that way. A lot of lizards and salamanders yep. walk this walk way. that way often, don't they? That's the, that's the typical way that you, t you think of a four-legged thing moving. Mm -hmm. But not only is there variation in how they move their legs, but in the phase. Yes. So sometimes the motion is totally in sync, both right legs move at exactly the same time and then both left legs or the diagonals but other times they're slightly offset when my cat walks she is slightly offset with her yeah. feet and this leads to all sorts of variation that can make it very difficult to identify how exactly were ancient quadrupeds moving well and it's because if you have two legs like us in theropod dinosaurs your options for walking is either, like, skipping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's not a whole lot of variation compared to yeah. four legs. Uh, twice or as many variables. <laughs> exactly. Well, and also, with the four legs, you have uh, two legs that are just walking, like our two legs, but then you have another set, and you can adjust the timing between those two infinitely. Yes. You, you And at one end of the scale, they will be synced up on one, either side. On the other end, they will be synced up diagonally. But in between those two, there is an infinite degree of synchronicity. In this study, the authors attempted, against the odds, to figure out how sauropods were walking. And they did it by examining three trackways. 
Now, a trackway is a long series of footprints left from an animal walking in a, in a long path. These three trackways come from the late Cretaceous of Arkansas. Now, estimating gait from trackways is tough because, A, all of what we just discussed, but also different gaits, different walking styles, can produce similar trackways, depending oh, yeah. on the size and speed of the animal. And the way you are walking can vary as you walk. So your gait can shift along the path you're moving for any number of reasons. So the authors set out to figure out what is a constant, what is something that shouldn't be changing that gives us a stable foundation to base our inferences off of, and they settled on the shape of the body. Okay. The distance from shoulders to hips should not change in an animal. Yes. While you're, while your body's not contorting and changing. So what they did was they looked at these trackways and they measured the footprints and the position of the footprints at different points along the trackway and then modeled different gates to say, all right, how would this gate produce these footprints and how would this gate do it? And then they used those models to say, if it was walking in that gate and produced these footprints, how long would the body have to be yeah. to produce these footprints from that gate? And what they found is that oftentimes when they did that, the size of the body, according to the models, would be fluctuating as you go throughout. Oh. Right? If you have the wrong gait, then it's going to give you different measurements along the pathway as the footprints change. It has to adjust. Yes, the model has to adjust. So what they did was they used their analysis to figure out which gait produces the least amount of body shape variation along the trackway. Oh, that's awesome. Say, this gait is the only one that matches a constant length of body. A stable body A form. stable body, which obviously a sauropod's body shouldn't be bending and shrinking and expanding. Man, when they discover the Accordionosaurus, that's really going to... That's going to throw a huge Ooh. wrench in here. <laughs> Now, they also tested this method with modern animals. Awesome. So they confirmed that it works by testing this analysis on modern animal trackways and then comparing the gait that it predicts to how those animals actually walk, which we can watch because they're still around. Yep. So they looked at trackways of dogs, horses, camels, and elephants Yee. and did their analysis. And the analysis predicted this gait and it was right for all the modern animals. That's so awesome. Which is a very good indication that, oh yeah, this, this is probably a pretty good method to use. And what they found is their analysis predicted that sauropods walked using diagonal couplets. Cool. Meaning front left and back right, and then front right and back left, like a cat, like a lot of modern animals. Interestingly enough, this is noticeably different from elephants. Oh. which is usually the group of animals that we tend to compare with things like sauropods because they have a similar large body and pillar-like legs. Elephants use lateral couplets. The left feet move and then the right feet move. And they're offset. Yes. You know, it's not in perfectly in sync like a camel or giraffe might be. Yeah, when, and when we say offset, it's like the back may pick up before the front does. Yes, exactly. And in the conversation article, they have a little model, uh, uh, an animated diagram of it. And back left starts moving, then front left, then back right, then front right. The way my I always used to think of it as a kid is it looks like the back leg is kicking the front one forward. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> as they move out of time. Now, this raises the question of why are sauropods and elephants not walking the same way if this is true? And the answer that they suggest is that elephants walk in a very narrow path. They almost are putting one foot in front of the other. Oh, right. Yeah. Their legs are very close together. But sauropods have a very wide gait, which means if you're moving both legs on one side of the body and then both legs on the other, you'd have to keep swaying back and forth. Because otherwise, you're, if you lift up both right legs, you're just going to fall over. So if sauropods walked in that lateral couplet style, they would need a lot of weight shifting side to side. But diagonal couplets means that you are supporting both sides of the body at all times. Well, and it, it, it balances your center of gravity. Like, that's why you could, if you had a perfectly balanced table, you could feasibly remove 
two of the opposite end legs <laughs> and it would stay balanced. It wouldn't be as stable as it was. Right. But as long as the legs are on either side of the center of gravity, they you should be able to balance it that way. So sauropods walking in that diagonal pattern won't have to worry about that weight distribution, which is different from most modern mammals, which tend to have a narrow gait, so that's not as much of a concern. But the authors did point out that one group of mammals today that does walk in the diagonal couplet instead of the lateral couplets are hippos. Hey. Which have a very wide body and a wide gait. I I started thinking of wide animals. (laughs) (laughs) Which is really cool. And I think the title of the conversation article is Sauropods seem to have walked more like hippos than elephants. But not for any habitat similarity or even that much of a size similarity, just the fact that they were wide body. Yeah, body shape more than body size. Yes. Being able to estimate the limb phase, the gait, the patterns of limb movement of ancient animals could have all sorts of important implications. It can help us understand trackways better. It can help us understand body size and locomotion. Now, there was a note in a different article I read that another sauropod researcher makes the very good point that this estimation, assuming this analysis is accurate, this indicates that diagonal couplet walking was the norm for these three sauropods that made these three trackways. We talked in episode 101 about how diverse and varied sauropods were. It is very possible that there were different patterns of walking across the grand diversity of sauropods. So this doesn't necessarily mean all sauropods did this, but it seems that at least some did. Oh yeah, like to go back to the last news, it was they mentioned and you know the fact that croc show galloping was one of the big points of hey maybe we should look into whether this actually is a mammalian thing, but not all crocs gallop. Oh yeah. Only, and not all mammals gallop. <laughs> exactly. Like this is not something that you can apply to the group. It, movement can still be incredibly it's still incredibly flexible mm-hmm. you can adjust the way you walk pr- pretty aggressively <laughs> i love getting to touch on topics like this because it's the kind of thing i don't think about but now that i've read about it i will be observing the way that animals walk and the the gait they use and the phase of their limb movements for at least the next week. Oh, yeah. When I see animals in videos or in the wild. Yep. Well, and I'm going to be watching elephants like a hawk every time they come. Yeah. <laughs> Watch them sway slightly. Yep. <laughs> That's awesome. It It's, I love that we can get that much information from a trackway because I, I would have very much expected that it would be near impossible because... I can have my feet land in almost identical places. Oh, yeah. Moving them in different timings. And I've talked to enough people about uncertainties in fossil trackway studies to know that there will almost certainly be other researchers who doubt this research just on the basis of how hard it is to get definitive information out of footprints. Yes. So, as usual, this is a recent study. It is certainly not going to be the last word but very intriguing implications. Cool. And that's the last news, which means it is time for us to move on to our main discussion. After this short musical break, we will be joined by this episode's special guest, our recurring guest, our favorite guest, no offense to all our other guests, (laughs) Dr. (laughs) Ali Baumgartner, who will be here to talk with us about seeds in modern times and their evolutionary history. Stay tuned. Hello, Allie. Hello! Welcome back to the podcast. We're happy to have you. I'm so happy to be here. I love doing this. Yay. (laughs) Happy spring. Yes, I am so happy to not be surrounded by snow all of the time. I'm pretty over that. (laughs) (laughs) And happy birthday. Thank you. I appreciate that. (laughs) (laughs) This episode is our special. I mean, it's not we're recording this well ahead of time, so it's not actually your birthday right now. But this episode comes out conveniently just in time for both the start of spring and your birthday, which means it's a perfect time for a plants episode with Allie. It's 
Probably the most appropriately timed episode we've done. It will never be this good. Yeah, yeah. it's the most alley-ish and plantish time. Yes. <laughs> yes. We've peaked. This is it. <laughs> this episode, as our audience already knows, we are talking about seeds. As usual for a plant episode, Will and I are very excited because we get to sit here and learn some stuff for the rest of the episode. So let's go ahead and jump right in, starting with the kind of question we always like to ask, the kind of question that I love because it's a very simple question with what I assume is a very complicated answer. Before we get into any of the details, Allie, please, what is a seed? A seed is an embryonic plant cocoon. There you go. Great. Ooh, That's all you did. We did it. Thanks for being here. <laughs> nice. I was really proud of that explanation. Okay, so now we're going to get into the, like, the actual explanation of what a seed is <laughs> fantastic technically a seed only needs two parts in order to be a seed it needs the embryo so the baby plant and the seed coat which is the cocoon basically typically they will also have basically baby seed food the endosperm but that's that's it they're actually kind of simple i mean they're super complicated but they're kind of simple so would you say that a, a seed, because I, I, I've thought about this in the past, is it fair to say that a seed is basically a plant version of an egg? Or an egg is a plant, an animal version of a seed? Sure. <laughs> I, yeah, basically, because when you talk about, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, so spoilers, when <laughs> we talk about terrestrialization and like moving away from the water, the origin of the seeds and the origin of like the amniotic egg that's they're basically the same step right it's a it's an embryo in a hard candy shell yes yeah exactly and and you can move it further from the water because of this gotcha neat so basically seeds are the dispersal and propagation units of spermatophyta which is just seed plants it literally means seed plants Mm -hmm. So today, the only plants with seeds are gymnosperms and angiosperms. So gymnosperm means naked seed, and angiosperm means enclosed seeds. So the names are very appropriate to this discussion. So historically, there were more groups that had seeds. There are the pro-gymnosperms, which is... <laughs> complicated group um so they were around from the devonian to the permian and the other group that had seeds were the seed ferns the teridospermatophyta literally the ferns with seeds uh, <laughs> and are they actually ferns or are they like they just kind of look like ferns genuinely oh my goodness i don't know I don't know. All right. I think yeah. as far as I, I read so many different things and <laughs> I don't know. It seems like they are not ferns, but they are fern shaped. But okay. when you're going this same so same thing with uh, pro gymnosperm, that's not a real group. Uh, seed fern it's at sometimes it's a real group depending on the like the level that we're at. Um but yeah. I do not deal with Paleozoic plant taxonomy. That is a scary, scary place. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the seed ferns were around from the Devonian to actually the Cretaceous. They are another one of the groups that got wiped out. So before we can go any further with our discussion of seeds, we have to talk about the scariest thing in botany, which is the alternation of generations. Okay, not carnivorous plants yeah. from episode 105. <laughs> also terrifying, but... I, I am less frightened of this, though, right now. Right. So... Right. Scare us. You're going to have to, you're gonna have to up, <laughs> yes. turn that dial up. So, the thing that strikes fear into the hearts of students everywhere is the alternation of generations. So, simply speaking, it is the alternation between a diploid and a haploid form. So, a diploid form is got two sets of chromosomes, right? You got the pair from one parent and the pair from the other, two sets of chromosomes. And then haploid is basically uh, the gametes of the egg and the sperm. There's only one set of chromosomes because it combines with the other set to make two. Okay, so this is the simplified version. We're gonna just power through this so that when I say sporophyte and gametophyte, there are no blank stares. Right. <laughs> so the sporophyte is... The diploid form, so it has a complete set of chromosomes, two sets, that produces spores, 
That's why it's called the sporophyte. Via meiosis. So the spores that it makes only have one set of chromosomes. So this is going to be your egg and your sperm. Right. So this is very much like us animals yes. where we are a body that is diploid. We have a dual set of chromosomes and each cell, all our DNA, and we make sperm and eggs, Yes, which each has half and they go out into the world or during mating to recombine and make another yes. double pair. Exactly. But this is the part where plants do a weird thing. So <laughs> the spore then germinates into a haploid gametophyte. It's a separate thing. Right, so a whole body, a yep. whole plant yep. that only has one set of... It'd be like if our sperm yes. from an animal d divided and grew like a sponge yeah. <laughs> into exactly. a whole other animal <laughs> exactly. that never received a second set of chromosomes. Fun fact, this is always how I headcanoned how facehuggers work. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I've yeah, diploid to haploid yep. yes. segments. Love it. Alternation of generations. <laughs> like, this is really applicable <laughs> information. <laughs> So a plant, a species of plant mm -hmm. through the generations, or a, a, a generation of plant, yes. a parent plant can give rise to offspring, and then offspring, and then offspring, and they can alternate from generation to generation. Yes. From a double chromosome organism to a single chromosome yes. organism. And then the single chromosome organism will produce the gametes. So it's not even like if the sperm became a thing, it was like the thing that makes the sperm <laughs> became a thing. It's, very, it's a bonus hmm. step. Plants are complicated and I love them. So then they will make the gametes via mitosis, but because uh, there are only one set of chromosomes, it can only make one set of chromosomes. And then it will fuse together with another gamete to form the zygote which is diploid, and that makes the sporophyte. So basically plants just separate the steps a little bit more. Um, and sometimes they are actually legitimately free living organisms. So in non-vascular plants, the sporophyte and the gametophyte are two separate organisms. They are free living, independent organisms. They're completely separate. In seed plants, the sporophyte is the dominant form. So like when you look at a tree, that's a sporophyte. The gametophyte is actually just a couple of cells within the sporophyte. But historically, they were super separated. And one of the very important things about that uh, gametophyte phase is when it is making those gametes, there are two ways to do it. There is homospory, where you make spores that are all the same size. Then that's what like, you know, bryophytes and ferns do primarily and then you have heterospory which is where you make two different sizes of spores so you have the microgametes that are the pollen and the megagametes that are the eggs and heterospory is super important to the evolution of seed plants gotcha all right so now you're not afraid of those words cool 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 <laughs> <laughs> so Quick recap for our, our audience, because this is this is very technical it, it, and it is. complicated. Sporophyte, like a person, like an animal, yes. two sets of chromosomes. Yes. Sometimes they are two different whole bodies of plant mm -hmm. through the generations. Mm -hmm. Other times, most of the body, like a tree, is, quote, normal mm -hmm. by our animal standards with yes. its full chromosomes. And you have a portion of it that is in charge of creating gametes. Yes. And when we talk about spores that they are creating, mm -hmm. we are talking about reproductive units. Yes. Pollen, eggs, sort of the equivalent of the animal sperm and egg. Yes. And are the spores that come together to create a zygote to grow into a new thing. Exactly. Like, honestly, <laughs> sexual reproduction is mostly the same regardless of the group that's doing it just plants have that right. extra step where sometimes they are they have half the set of chromosomes and that sure. makes it that makes it seem scary but really it's not it's you know it's fine so then we have pollination so the only way you can get a seed is via pollination in order to do that <laughs> I feel like we're having the talk because, I mean, we literally are. This is the birds and yep, the bees right, right now. Like, this is what's but happening. it's the ferns and the trees. It is the ferns <laughs> and the trees. So <laughs> the pollen and the egg have to meet somehow. So that can be, 
in angiosperms, the pollen comes from the male part of the, the flower, which is the anther. In gymnosperms, the pollen will come from male cones, um, and it has to meet up with the female part. So the female part is the stigma of the flower, so that's where the pollen needs to go. And in gymnosperms, it's going to be the female cone. So basically, regardless of if it's going from cone to cone or flower to flower, the pollen and the egg need to, they need to meet up somehow. For gymnosperms, uh, cycads and ginkgo have motile sperm, so it will just swim its way into the ovule and into the egg. So water is required for this. Conifers and nidophytes, so that's like needum and ephedra or wellwichia, which is one of my favorite weirdo plants, have non-modal sperm, so they have this pollen tube that basically like sucks it up. More like a slide, but anyway, so it can get into the egg. <laughs> Angiosperms use what's called double fertilization, and that is pollen has basically two sperm in it. So the pollen lands on the stigma, which triggers a pollen tube, which grows down into the plant ovary. The pollen grain has two gametes. One fuses with what's called a polar body to make the endosperm. So basically makes the plant food. And then the other one actually fuses with the ovule to make the embryo. So double fertilization. One part of fertilization is making the baby plant. One part of fertilization is making the baby plant's food. Right, and that is very much like in an egg where you have the embryo and the yolk. Yes. And the yolk is what is providing food. Uh, episode 92 for eggs. Yes, exactly. Like, honestly, there are there's a lot of overlap between the way that, you know, sexual reproduction works in plants and animals. Because, like, an egg is really just an egg, <laughs> like, regardless oh, yeah. it, of whose it is. If you're wanting to make a baby version of yourself, there are some basic things you need. You need two <laughs> sets of DNA you need some food for it to grow and you yeah. need to protect it. Like Exactly. Okay, so I've broadly mentioned that there are three parts of the seed. So now that we have made the seed via fertilization, let's talk about it. So the embryo is probably the most important part of the seed because it is... I would think so. Yeah, exactly. It's literally the whole point of the seed. <laughs> so it is the fertilized ovule. It is the baby plant. They have cotyledons, which are the seed leaves. So when I'm talking about a monocotyledonous plant, that is the embryonic plant has one seed leaf. A dicotyledonous plant has two seed leaves, typically. Gymnosperms can have at least two, but really how many they want. <laughs> and that's what monocot, dicot, that is shortened based on the number of baby leaves that it has. And it's really funny that the baby leaves tend to not actually look much at all like the grown up leaves. Got it. So when you say a seed leaf, is that a literally a leaf that is on or in the seed? It, yes. So when you were a kid, did you grow beans in class? Yep. Okay. So when you, so you take like the little bean and you put it in a paper towel Right? And, you, and it sprouts. So mm -hmm. that first leaf that forms, once it sprouts and, you know, it pops out, you know, it's got a shoot going one direction, the root going the other. That first leaf that appears above the, the seed is the seed leaf. It was chilling inside, just waiting for that moment. And it's fascinating because, like I said, they don't always look like they're adult leaves. In fact, they often really don't because they don't have to. Like... They're just there to get things started, and then they peace out and fall off pretty quickly. Well, okay. And I find that so interesting because it, it, once again, mirroring things hatching from eggs. There are certain things where it's like, you can develop like your feathers later on, but you're going to need this egg tooth to get out and get going. There are certain things that you can't develop after you hatch. You need to have this ready when you hatch. And it's neat that plants have that with their leaves of... Once you sprout, the next most important thing is to start collecting sunlight. So we don't want to waste time with you growing a leaf. You're going to have one before you even sprout. Exactly. Otherwise, you don't get to eat. And that's, you know, that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> this is also interesting because I never realized that the distinction between monocot and dicot came down to early development in the life of the plant. That also mirrors a ways that we classify animals. You know, when we talk about 
protostomes and deuterostomes, we are separating animals into the way that their embryos develop early on because those are major defining features of different groups of organisms. Yeah, and I really enjoy how much overlap they're like life is life. And so it's fascinating that, you know, animals, plants, like they're fundamentally different. But like in many ways they're really not. Well, it depends on what level you're looking at yes. them. You know, if <laughs> at one level they are wholly alien to one another. But when you're getting down to like the cellular level, so like, I mean life's life's life. Yeah. You only got so many building boxes to choose from. <laughs> So we've got the embryo, then we have the seed coat. So this develops from the integument of the ovule. So basically, um, the integument is, it's kind of an envelope. It's basically the outside of the ovule. So it's there to protect the seed. It, you know, the seed coat is exactly what it sounds like. It's the coat to protect the seed from the elements. I saw it described really well. It protects from mechanical injury, predators, and drying out. So the last part is the endosperm. So that's the plant food. So I mentioned that in angiosperms, that is formed via that double fertilization, right? So you have the one that makes the baby and one that makes the food. So it's formed from both the pollen and the female tissue. And then in gymnosperms, it's also called the endosperm, but is formed completely differently. And it just uses tissue from the female gametophyte. It's plant food. That's all that matters. Doesn't matter how it got there. It's plant food. (laughs) So we've got an embryo, a food source, and an outer shell. Yeah. So once again, plant eggs. Yes. Plant eggs. Yes. Great. And that endosperm, that's what makes seeds so good to eat. Yeah. It's food. It's good for, you know, good for plants and for us. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So seeds basically have three main functions. So embryo nourishment, like I said. They are fed with this. And it's fascinating because this is something I hadn't really thought about, but makes a whole lot of sense. Seedlings grow a lot faster than sporlings do. Which, first of all, never heard them called sporlings before, but yes, please. Fantastic. It makes sense, right? Because they have these food reserves. They are able to just get off to a good start because they got everything that they need. They can just hit the ground running. Neat. Right? Like, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I I think that that's really interesting to note because when you talk about how plants can alternate, basically, between reproducing mitotically, clonally, Mm -hmm. and just not even bothering with combining multiple sets of chromosomes and creating a haploid, a one-chromosome organism, it does raise the question of, well, why wouldn't you do that all the time? Why even bother with the whole making a seed situation? Mm-hmm. And that's one good answer to that question is, well, a seed is more efficient. It grows faster. It's got all these benefits to it. Exactly. And if you're undergoing like clonal, you know, asexual reproduction, you're normally sprouting off where the parent is. But another factor of seeds is they allow for long distance dispersal because they're protected. They can go away. Again, I saw another nice quote that was, a seed must somehow arrive at a location and be there at the time favorable for germination and growth. Yeah. A seed is never late. It arrives exactly when it needs to. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I I also like this because it's kind of the plant's version of parental care. Like, not exactly, but it is setting the embryo up for success. Yes. Putting it in the little basket and setting it afloat. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Down the river. Instead of just being like, all right, you embryo go grow on that rock. Like, (laughs) you know, I've spread spores. You just need to start being a plant now. Like I've given you protection. I've given you food. You're going to be able to grow very quickly and competitively with this burst of food. It's, it's got that. I handed you off to this nice bear and he's going to carry you across the landscape. We'll talk about that more later. (laughs) I can't wait. (laughs) Uh, So yeah, dispersal often in angiosperms, this is assisted by fruits, but You don't necessarily need a fruit in order to be dispersed. And then the last thing is dormancy. So there are two main functions when it comes to dormancy in seeds. So it can synchronize germination um, to maximize survival so that, you know, you don't immediately like, you know, a spore drops. It's kind of got to do its thing right now. If you're in a seed, you can wait until the optimal moment. On kind of the flip side of that, 
you can also spread out germination so that you're not wiped out by one bad day. Basically the same thing. Like once you release your spores, like they just gotta gotta go. So you can sync things up, spread things out. You have a little bit more leniency with timing. So what you're saying is that if you release a bunch of spores, the only time that all of those spores can sporify is now. But if you send a bunch of seeds out, they might encounter the right conditions at different times. So one batch of seeds might be starting to sprout across a period of weeks or months or however long it takes for each of them to find the right time. Yeah, depending on what the criteria criteria are that causes it to break its dormancy. Yeah. So if a flood happens or a wildfire comes through and half the seeds still haven't germinated, mm-hmm. then great. We've still got half of our seeds ready to go. Exactly. Exactly. And that's really exciting because when you're trying to move away from the water and really spread out, you know, plants can't walk around. This is how this is how they spread out. So combining this ability to disperse a little bit further with waiting for that perfect time, you know, plants are doing all right. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Handy little capsules of life. <laughs> So we've talked about what makes seeds, seeds, what unites seeds. But of course, seeds, as you mentioned, are common to a wide variety of plants. I know almost nothing about plants, but even I can think off the top of my head of different types of seeds. Yeah. So, Allie, can you give us a sense of the diversity of seeds? How many types of seeds are there? Yeah, exactly. Uh, List them, please. Please list all of them. We'll wait. Alphabetically would be preferable. (laughs) I... So my notes specifically say, so many. (laughs) (laughs) That's all. Quoting the notes. Yes. So. Bunches. Oh my goodness. So much. Because this is where I want to, again, get a little bit technical. Sorry, y'all. I want to make sure that I am emphasizing the difference between a seed and a fruit. Please do. Mm -hmm. Because... We don't have to worry about that with gymnosperms. They don't re- they don't have fruits. And even when they have fruits, they're just pretending they're not really fruits. Now, when we talk about gymnosperms, for any of our uh, audience who haven't heard us talk about plants much before. Yes. Gymnosperms are largely conifers. Yes. And they're fellow non-flowering things. Yes. So <laughs> that is technically correct. I'll allow it. So conifers are the one that people are probably <laughs> most uh, familiar with. But also ginkgo, that is another conifer. Mm -hmm. Cycads, which look like palm trees, palm plants, but are not. And nidophytes, which are just the weirdos. Like I said, there's Welwichia, which is a plant with two leaves, but like massive leaves. They they just kind of uh, split and look like lots of leaves. Anyway, yeah. (laughs) So our gymnosperms, our naked seed plants. Yes. And then our angiosperms, which is our flowering plants, mm-hmm. which is th- throw a rock and you'll hit an angiosperm. <laughs> yeah. Episode 57 for more details. Yes. Our flowers and such. Yes. And the reason they are called an enclosed seed, angiosperm means enclosed seed, is because they are covered with fruits. And there are multiple different types of fruits. I'm not going to go into that now. But broadly, broadly speaking, there are two categories of fruits. There are fleshy fruits and there are hard fruits um so fleshy fruits are going to be like the things that you think of when you think of fruit so that's going to be like melons and apples and cherries and pomegranates and all that sort of stuff those are fruits those are the tasty ones yes but hard fruits are going to include things like akines which are Air and capsules and things like that. So that basically they are not <laughs> tasty. They are hard parts that protect the seed and they are dehiscent or indehiscent. Either they will split open in the have like a slit where it opens or they'll just kind of explode. So in a lot of instances, if you are thinking of a seed, that's a fruit. A maple Samara is a fruit. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Mm-hmm. What, what's a sunflower seed? A nakeen, I believe. It's also a fruit. Okay, so the, the part that you crack open to get at the seed inside, yep. that's the fruit. Yeah, the seed is inside, and the hard part on the outside is a fruit. Gotcha. So if you have to crack it open, a walnut 
is a fruit. Mm -hmm. A coconut is a fruit. (laughs) There is a seed inside, but like when you see a coconut on a tree, like it's got the, the, the soft part on the outside. So like, I want to emphasize that, that when you are thinking of a fruit, or when you're thinking of a seed, you may actually be thinking of a fruit, but that's fine. Cause there's still a whole lot of diversity within that. Like if you look at, um, you know, all of your beans, those are seeds. Uh, if you think about corn kernels, you've got seeds in there. There's a lot of diversity in what me- makes a seed. But if you ask a botanist, there are 11 seed types in two categories. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Nice. I love boxes. Yeah. Pro box. So there are 11 types. They're super technical. I will not be going into detail just to know. There are six types in monocots, ten types in dicots, and two in gymnosperms. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So angiosperms have really come up with all sorts of different ways to be a seed. Yes. Like, angiosperms are pioneering the seed field. And we'll go into that later, but like, they are at the forefront. Broadly speaking, within that, there are two types. There are the ones that are endospermic so that means that the embryo is inside of the embryo uh, the endosperm and they eat it all up before they germinate cool uh and then there are the non-endosporic ones that don't really use it all um before they germinate so dicots tend to be non-endospermic and monocots some dicots and gymnosperms tend to be endospermic which is interesting that we have these two different types so I'm going to ask you a question. We're ready. ready. I didn't know there would be a quiz. Yeah, yeah. No, I did not sign up. How many times do you think that seeds evolved? Oh, man. I've been wondering this. <laughs> hmm. I am going to be gutsy. I'm going to take a gamble. I'm going to say one. I was going to go with two. Okay. Okay. So. 26. <laughs> <laughs> Zero. Mind <laughs> blown. I was, so I was gonna I was gonna write this to be like at least once. Because no kidding. Like it did show up once. We're not sure. Definitely okay. at least once. Because <laughs> we've got seeds. <laughs> but this is the thing that I was talking about, that like you have pro gymnosperms, which isn't really a group. Uh, it's just kind of like these are the things that aren't quite gymnosperms yet but aren't really anybody else and that's where you get gymnosperms and somewhere in there is where angiosperms come from but i do not know where the seed ferns live are they part of the pro gymnosperms are they not like so at least once possibly twice but at least once which if you had asked me how many times have seeds evolved i wouldn't have guessed one like I would not have, it that everything evolves multiple times. Like there's no right. way that seeds only arose once. But so if if seeds only arose once, the implication of that evolutionarily would mean that some ancient plant ancestor, some early plant mm-hmm. group developed seeds, and then the seed ferns, the gymnosperms, and the angiosperms all inherited. Yes, and altered and modified into their particular version of seeds yes the alternative being that different groups of plants independently convergently episode Mm -hmm. 70 evolved different types of seeds exactly and at a bare minimum it's very likely that every seed plant today has a common ancestor Um, because as far as we know angiosperms came from some gymnosperm ancestor so yeah gymnosperms angiosperms very closely related probably all have the same the you know the same ancestor with seeds but those those seed ferns who knows <laughs> <laughs> yeah i hadn't even really considered about extinct lineages of seeds having evolved separately and then disappearing right and yeah that's that's a lot to consider yeah i was i was <laughs> i was trying to look it up and sometimes they would refer to them as pro gymnosperms and like the large group is paraphyletic somebody said it was paraphyletic someone else said it was polyphyletic regardless not a natural group medulosins that's a real group we'll talk about those later but so within seeds 
there is so much variability. So just the seed coat. So the part that is protecting the seed itself, you know, the, the, the baby seed in the endos endosperm is super variable from as thin as paper on peanuts. So that paper part that you peel off the peanut before you eat it, that's the seed coat. Is that a fruit? Uh, no, it is not because it is a tuber. Oh, uh, right. Uh, so you mean the papery, like the, the reddish. Yep. Yeah. After you thing. crack open yep. the two section pod, the yep. paper, right. the filmy, yep. gotcha. crinkly bit. Yep. That's the seed coat. That's okay. the seed coat. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So if you've ever seen like a hairy coconut, and you cut it in half, right? And you you got the the hairy black co or brown coconut, and you got the white flesh on the inside. That's a seed, and so you're looking at how thick <laughs> that seed coat is for a coconut. Well, and I I feel like that's why it's because when you know when sunflower seeds came up, that's why it can be so tricky to to separate out seed from fruit mm -hmm. because. I would have assumed that the part I was cracking open on a sunflower seed was the seed coat. Mm -hmm. That that's I was popping that open. Yeah. And not that it was the shell of the fruit. Right. But then on a coconut, I would have assumed after learning about the sunflower seed, I would assume that that was also the same sort of thing that I must be having to get through the hard fruit. But no, that's the seed coat. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> weird. Nature doesn't care about your terminology. <laughs> <laughs> this one's my favorite. So if you've ever eaten a pomegranate or at least seen the seeds of a pomegranate people get confused because you you know you say you're eating the seeds but it's like eating a grape right like it's really it's really juicy so that is a particular type of seed coat because there is a little tiny seed inside and then it has that like it's basically a succulent yeah the water balloon around it yeah yeah that's <laughs> called a sarcotesta <laughs> Okay. Which is a particular type of seed coat. I've heard that word before, and I bet it was in regards to some fossil. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, that yeah. would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, even just the outer covering of the seed can be so variable. If we talk about dispersal, we were talking about this before. So the diversity of, dis of dispersal, so much. So much. <laughs> so they all have really cool names. If it is dispersed by wind, that is called a nemocori. Ooh, cool. Good name, right? So sometimes it's just the seed itself that's being dispersed. So we talked about orchids. Mm -hmm. Episode 125. And how they have really teeny tiny, like basically, I've seen them described as dust, as lint, just teeny tiny little seeds that just <laughs> will be carried away on a puff of wind. Right. Dandruff. <laughs> when we talk about dispersal, we are meaning... The action of a seed getting from one place to another, which, as we mentioned before, can be really important. Yes. Because you don't want your seed to just drop amidst the roots of the parent plant. Correct. You want them to be able to spread and find nice fertile areas to grow. Well, it's you know same as many people, you know, many parents don't want their kids living with them forever. Right. I need you to disperse <laughs> to college and go... Find friends and new family to disperse with. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. So you have seeds that can just be picked up by the wind. Some of times they'll have not fruits, but just accessories to help them disperse. So pine seeds. Pine seeds just have little wings on them to help them fly a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> Milkweed and poplar so milkweed, uh, those little hairs help it to be dispersed, help the seeds be dispersed on the wind. Actually, I believe that's the same thing with uh, cotton also has those little hairs. Some fruits or some plants use fruits to assist with this. So dandelions have achenes. Um, so you have the little puff on the end that's attached to the achene, which inside that is the seed and it gets fly away that way. And then you have maple samaras, which you have basically this husk over the seed that has the wings on it so that it can go a little bit further. So, so like, uh, cause I've seen the winged ones before. I've seen, I know there's the ones that are like the, the, the flying wing, you know, stealth bomber where it has the two <laughs> wings on either side and actually glides. Yes. I've seen those seeds before. And then, uh, and I don't remember which plant it is, but they were all over my yard where I grew up. Uh, that have the helicopter, the one wing that yes. spirals down. I can't remember who that is, but I should. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're super. They're so cool. I love those things. So that wing is just an a, a 
outgrowth of the seed, it, out of the seed coat? It depends. Oh, sometimes the, good. yeah, so sometimes it's just kind of like a an accessory coming off the seed coat. But sometimes it's actually a fruit. Hey. Of course it is. Sure, sure. You, you should have me come talk about fruits sometime, because like... <laughs> maybe, maybe we will. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so that... Er- Those are things that are dispersed by wind. Your next group are things that are dispersed by water. So these are dispersed by hydrochory. And there aren't nearly as many things that do this. Basically, if your seed can float, that's good. Go team. So if you have these buoyant seeds, there are two different genera that that do it. And they're called uh, either sea beans or drift seeds. And I think that's adorable. (laughs) Sea beans is really good. <laughs> sea beans is so good. The uh, seed coat has a little propeller on the back of it, and it just yeah. through the water. Well, sea beans makes me think of like toe beans. <laughs> oh, just so precious. <laughs> and then finally, the the method that most people are probably familiar with, and it's what you were talking about earlier, is zoocory. It's dispersed by animals. You hand it to an animal and say, deliver this somewhere. <laughs> Again, there are a couple of different ways that you can come at this. So you can have ectozoochory or endozoochory. Either you stick it to the outside or you flush it through the inside. Yeah. So um, for ectozoochory, so seeds on the outside of an animal, they're going to have barbs or hooks coming off them and again this is more of an an accessory thing not so much a fruit thing and that's going to be things like your burrs so the burdock plant sometimes you will have seeds with fleshy coverings that aren't fruits so like junipers will do this junipers are conifers juniper berries are not fruits they're not berries Basically, it's just a pedantic thing. It wasn't derived from part of a flower. It's coming from a different um, part of the plant. But mm-hmm. <laughs> whoever's eating it doesn't care. Um, yeah. <laughs> we sure didn't when we named it. Exactly. <laughs> so back in the days when I would do field work out in like shrubland or walk through those sort of dry areas, those spiky koosh balls that yeah. would get stuck to my socks and my shoes. Yeah. That's for seed dispersal? Yes. Cool. Because you did. You dispersed those seeds. I did. All the way back to my tent. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And then you drop them outside of your tent and you disperse the seeds. Good work. Yeah. And I helped. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. I've definitely dispersed some to the garbage, though. Right. Yeah. You followed me too far. (laughs) That's the gamble. That's why you make a whole bunch of seeds, just in case. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So yeah, sometimes uh, they'll do it with fruit assistance. So your fleshy fruits and also nuts. Yeah. So, you know, make it palatable. But my favorite subcategory of zucchori is uh, myrmecocori. Ants. Yes. Seeds that are dispersed by ants have something called an oleosome. And what that is, is basically just a gift to the ants. So it is a fleshy structure on the seed. So again, it's like a little hat that is full of lipids and proteins. So the pl- the ants will carry the seed away so that they can share this tasty, tasty treat and then just kind of discard the seed. But the place that the seed is getting discarded is full of frass. You know, ant poop. And it's really a great place to live. Um, and so that helps it germinate. And so this is found in trilliums, acacias, and some members of the family Proteaceae. I remember seeing uh, one of these in a, in a ant documentary. And they were noting that some of these seeds even have structures to make them easier to carry by the ants. Like e- easier to grasp so that they can be transported efficiently. Yeah. These seeds are built for ants to use them. Yes. It's an offering. It's the plant going, here, please accept this offering. Take care of my babies. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so we've got ectozoochory when you're sticking it to the outside. And then as we uh, address, but a kind of breezed by just to make sure our, no one misses it. Endozoochory is where you have your tasty, delicious fruit that encourages animals to eat it carry those seeds around in their belly until they are ready to dispose of the waste and oftentimes depositing the hardy seeds 
in a convenient pile of fertilizer. Which is why I always feel a little bit bad when I don't eat the core of the apple. <laughs> like you put so much work into this to get me to eat these seeds and I'm going to I'm going to throw them all away. Right. I am purposely avoiding them. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry there's too much cyanide. Yeah. In your core. I just mm. Is it cyanide? Arsenic? It's one of those. So cherries have cyanide. And that's the thing, too. Like, some of these seeds are chock full of poisons. <laughs> <laughs> like you do. Listen, you're depositing this seed one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is true. So cherries are just full of cyanide. Like, just don't, do not eat cherry stones. That's bad. <laughs> don't, so, the, okay, also... If you've ever read like like a golden age mystery like Agatha Christie sort of stuff, they talk about cyanide tasting like bitter almonds. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is almonds are in the same genus as cherries. Oh, uh, so don't eat bitter almonds. Don't eat build yeah yeah. This is why dogs can't eat almonds because their dogs are smaller than us. There's little bit so yeah you can't have too many almonds in a day because um, they do have like low level but they do have cyanide in them. Oh man, so, you I'm, you should have told us this. Way yeah, earlier. I was gonna, I'm glad I'm glad you're saying this because I've put I've definitely put away a whole bag of almonds. Oh yeah, <laughs> just you know be aware. Now we know. <laughs> there is... I gotta go set up an appointment. <laughs> <laughs> you're probably fine. You're bigger than a dog, but like oh well, thank you. You know lo you're low level, low level. Good to know. This is a PSA. Uh, this <laughs> to podcast, all dogs listening right now. <laughs> this podcast should not be used as medical or veterinarian advice. No, but, but also, uh, don't, eat too many don't eat too many almonds. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, plants are upset that mammals exist and are secretly trying to kill us. So like... But also using us. Yeah. Like, they need us. Yes. They're like, don't eat my yeah. fruits, but please eat my fruits. Allie, We're getting yeah. mixed signals. You know this isn't a spooky episode, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know... We're done oh, with it. The monster plants can stay right. out of it. I'm sorry. I was confused. <laughs> the murder Seeds plants. covered in spikes and full of cyanide. That's exactly Goodness. what this is. I love, I love plants so much. <laughs> Okay, so the last category is dormancy. And I'm going to go through this a, a little quicker just because you can get really bo uh, bogged down in this. But not all seeds undergo, undergo dormancy. So they might not necessarily have a period where they don't germinate. I saw this and I smiled and I think y'all are going to like it. Some mangroves are viviparous. <laughs> Whoa. Oh. Now, viviparous is a term, uh, dear listeners, that refers to typically animals that give live birth as opposed to laying eggs. I did not know viviparity was a term that could be used for plants. <laughs> I didn't either. I didn't either. Is, is this referring to the little, the little shoots they drop yes! and float away? Yes. I didn't know. Oh, yeah. I just didn't think of it in those terms because we had mangroves at the aquarium and would just, we'd get those drops all over the path. Yeah. Every now and then you'd just be walking like, oop, baby mangrove so they drops just, on the floor. So like an animal would, like a, most mammals would, instead of laying an egg seed yeah. to carry and nourish the embryo, they just drop a baby? Yeah. I never thought of it as as live birth and that's, oh that's man. That's so cool. I need to call all my friends that's so <laughs> I, this was exactly the reaction I wanted. Like I'm. That's awesome, uh, right? It is so cool. Yeah. So they they germinate while they're still attached to the tree, and they're robust enough that yeah, they can drop and just go to town. Mangroves are so cool. This is a fact. Whoa. Oh. Uh, so similar, not quite the same, but similarly, cultivated plants are often selected to not have a dormant period, so that you mm -hmm. can buy your seeds, sow your seeds, and have them sprout, so that you don't have to wait for whatever trigger you need to end the dormancy yeah you don't want to plant them and be like oh, i'm not feeling like it <laughs> i guess i guess over the next six months or whatever <laughs> you know, all my seeds will germinate <laughs> so when day. you're gonna sprout who knows <laughs> but like kind of so dormancy we should define this term basically is a seed not germinating under what should be optimal environmental conditions so basically like this makes me think of hitting the snooze button. <laughs> like, I should right. be getting up right now, but like, I, I'm not ready. 
Oh, man, that puts it in perspective. <laughs> Spring starts today, but five more days, Mom. Yeah, this is the optimum situation for you to get up. And yet. <laughs> and yet. So I'm going to talk about two things that aren't quite dormancy, but are probably things that you are familiar with. And they're kind of called dormancy. It's very confusing. So there is photo dormancy. See, it's very confusing. It's called dormancy. It's not really dormancy. But photo dormancy is basically... The seed needs a particular light regime in order to germinate. So either it needs a certain amount of light or it needs a certain amount of darkness. And if it does not get that, it will not germinate. So that can mean that if a seed needs light, so it's a very thin seed coat and it needs light, if it is buried too deep, it won't germinate. If you have a seed that needs a period of darkness in order to germinate and you bury it not deep enough, it won't germinate because it's not getting the darkness that it needs. You'll also have what's called thermodormancy. And this is seed sensitivity to heat or cold. So some um, seeds will only germinate at high temperatures. So like cockleburr or amaranth. And some seeds will only germinate if the soil is cold, such as celery. Huh. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. Like, you have plants all over the world and in every environment. Like, you have shade areas, you have sunny areas, you have hot areas, you have cold areas. It makes sense that you'd have seeds that prefer each of those conditions to to be born. Exactly. Exactly. Um. So that way, again, you're not... Everybody's trying to get born at the same time because... That's not necessarily going to work, right? There are still limited resources. <laughs> you're going to try to, you know, stagger it. So as I mentioned, you're trying to kind of spread out the timing and also uh, synchronize. A little bit of both. There are four main categories of dormancy based on what is causing the condition that is making it remain dormant. So there is exogenous uh, dormancy, which means that it's something outside of the seed. So that can be, it's too wet, it's too dry, this sort of thing. Once it gets wet enough, once it gets dry enough, it'll be able to germinate. You have endogenous dormancy, which is caused by conditions within the embryo. So that can be the embryo is, or within the seed. So the embryo may not be differentiated enough. It may not have developed far enough to be able to <laughs> sprout. It could be a combination of both of those things. So maybe the seed isn't able to sprout yet because it's not grown big enough, but also it's way too dry out there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's like in a video game where you are trying to complete a challenge and there are multiple things that you got to do in order to complete the challenge. So you could... Sometimes you can do it in either order and then eventually like, okay, cool. I did both the things that I need to do in order to achieve germination. There are multiple ways that you can do that, whether or not it's inside, outside, a combination of both of those things, or it's just not the right conditions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if, if you don't achieve these, these ideal conditions, then you're, you might just wait until it's nice out. Yeah. And I know that there are some dormancies that can last ridiculous amounts of time i was just gonna say yeah. ali i'm gonna i want i would i wanted to ask this question that i know is a tricky question how long can dormancy last a long time like a long time and this is why we make um seed banks so mm -hmm. we have the millennium seed bank is in svalbard and it is basically important seeds to humans kept in basically a glacier <laughs> in case of apocalypse <laughs> but even under not like you know glacial circumstances they can last a really long time you know easily decades in fact didn't they germinate a seed from the pleistocene yep. yeah there yeah there have been i've heard of i think two different cases where researchers have excavated seeds out of permafrost yes i think it was siberia because it's always siberia yeah uh, or maybe one of them was from the yukon i think it was siberia though at least one of which were seeds that were estimated to be like thirty thousand years old yes and then they germinated them into if i remember correctly a 
slightly different relative of a modern species of plant. Yes. So that's obviously an extreme. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they had the benefit of putting it on ice. In general, it tends to not be quite that long. If for no other reason, then they might get buried too deep and not be able to germinate um, just yep. because they don't meet the requirements. So I was talking about the timing. Not quite the same thing, but it's friends with it. Some species will have what are called mast years. So they'll normally have a normal amount of seeds. And then for whatever reason, like all the oaks synchronize, like this is the year we are just (laughs) going to make a metric ton of acorns. And they're not all going to survive, but it's going to bolster that seed bank. You know, some of them will get eaten. It's the same thing that like cicadas do, right? Like if there's enough of us, they can't eat us all. Yeah. And so they will bolster their seed banks in case of emergency. You might get, you know, an old tree dies, you get a light a light gap, and then you can have somebody just waiting in the wings. All right, the criteria have been met. I can grow now. Well, it, it makes it such an interesting and very cool situation with plants. It was, it's how I often feel with things like uh, molds, but also like algae, you know, that'll grow if you if you leave your, your shower damp for too long, you'll get some green some green algae growing and I'll have that moment of like, how did you get here? Like how, I'm not, I'm nowhere near a lake. This is ridiculous. You know, and it's cause yeah, cause those spores are everywhere. It means you can have that kind of with plants where you could have a patch that nothing's been growing. Cause you've had it in shade under something for a very long time. And then you remove that shade and suddenly a bunch of things are not, dispersed there but had been dispersed there and just suddenly grow they were just waiting for the perfect opportunity that's really neat like it's just under your feet are many baby plants just waiting for the right moment exactly that's exactly what's happening i love it so we've talked about what seeds are what seeds do and all of the varied well some of the varied (laughs) ways that they are and that they do it What do you say we start looking back in time and get into some of the evolution and fossil history? Oh, yeah. Paleontology. Of seeds. Right. This is a paleontology podcast. What do you say? And our friend Allie is a paleobotanist. That's true. Let's take a short break. And then after a little musical interlude, let's talk about uh, the first thing I'm going to ask you about, Allie, is how seeds (laughs) came to be. Oh, no. I better prepare myself. (laughs) Stay tuned, everybody. Allie, please tell us about the first seeds. I actually have a pretty, like, simple answer for this, weirdly. (laughs) Is it, we don't know, let's move on? (laughs) No, actually. Okay. Sometimes that's the answer. (laughs) I know, right? So, to preface, though, I read a couple of, like, papers about this. And the thing that I found most fascinating was what people consider the first seed plant. Because... To me, the first seed plant is the first plant with seeds. That's how I would define it. <laughs> right. I mean, that that does make a whole bunch of sense. I'm confused as to how else you would define it. So there were a couple of things that have what are called pre-ovules. So these are precursors to seeds. So they're not really seeds, but they're not really... The things that came before seeds. If you start with that, that is a seed fern called uh, Runcaria from the Middle Devonian. Okay, so about 400 million years ago. But I don't like that answer. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think that the first seed uh, plant should not actually have seeds. So the oldest known plant with seeds is again a seed fern. Super cool. Wish I knew more about them. Elksinia polymorpha so this is from the late devonian approximately 370 million years ago but we're pretty confident like this is this for real real has seeds so people agree on that so 
earliest evidence of actual seeds is from the late Devonian. All right. That's not bad. Like, good work. Yeah, that makes sense because we talked about how seeds are important for land dispersal. Exactly. And the late Devonian was a very important time in Earth history for things moving on to land. Exactly. So when we're talking about uh, terrestrialization, the story in plants, the story in animals, honestly, not that much different. We don't have any embryos from the Devonian. So that's unfortunate, but hey, we got seed plants. That's neat. The major group of these non-gymnosperm, non-angiosperm seed plants, so was the medullosins. So they are a group of seed ferns that live from the Carboniferous to the Permian. So the end of the uh, Paleozoic. They're they're a real group, which makes me happy because they're basically <laughs> the only Paleozoic group that's real. Now, when you say real, for clarity for our listeners, what we mean is a group that actually is, based on the evidence we have, a group of related species that all share the same ancestor. As opposed to when you were saying like pro-gymnosperms, which means basically anything that doesn't fit in this other category, whether or not they are actually that closely related. Exactly. Exactly. You know, when we talk about like a waste bucket taxon, it's that sort of thing. Like, eh, it's not a gymnosperm, so we're going to call it a pro-gymnosperm because it kind of looks like a gymnosperm or like a seed fern. It looks like a fern, but it has seeds. So seed fern. Sure. Medullosins. That's a real group, which is exciting. So they were trees, which also is exciting to me. And so the earliest seeds that we were seeing in the Devonian are going to be teeny tiny, like millimeters, absolutely teeny seeds. When you get to the Carboniferous in the Medullosins, then you see actually macroscopic seeds. So they are millimeters to centimeters. <laughs> Uh Oh, I know, right? Deluxe. I know. And embryos can be preserved. Cool. So we can begin to understand the baby plant in addition to the other parts. So normally, you can see the seed size. You can see some things about the seed coat. But if you can see the embryo, that gives you additional useful information. Right. This is just like finding fossil eggs. Yes. If you just find the shell, that's tons of, in- that's great. But if you are lucky enough to find a shell with embryo remains preserved inside, that's a whole new level of info. Exactly. Because you can learn a whole lot more. So the seeds that we're seeing in the Carboniferous actually have a seed coat. The seeds that we were seeing in the Devonian didn't. So the earliest seeds, again, like, is it a seed if it doesn't have a seed coat? I digress. (laughs) Had what's called a cupule. So basically, the seed coat completely envelops the seed. You know, it completely covers the embryo and the endosperm. A cupule is basically... (laughs) Oh my goodness. Okay, this was the first analogy I thought of. I think it's genius. It's basically the cupcake the paper cupcake liner like the tin liner the wrapper yes Mm. exactly so it doesn't completely cover the tasty tasty muffin inside (laughs) but it kind of protects it so that's what the cupule is doing it kind of goes around it doesn't completely encase it goes up a little bit further than like the wrapper of a cupcake (laughs) so this is like if the egg equivalent of a full seed coat is the full eggshell, and the cupule is like togepi. There you go. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there we She's go. She's got that bottom half yeah. that's yes. just sort of holding it there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. It's just a goblet of seed. There you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of like the ball in a cup. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Man. Must have been tough for those early plants to get them in there. <laughs> right. That's why they evolved into the fully. Co- that's yes. really hard. Oh, I love this so much. <laughs> but yeah, so these early seeds, so you can get permineralized medullosin seeds. So permineralized basically means that the organics have been replaced with minerals, but you can see the structures. It's the right size. It's the right shape. If you do like a CT scan, you can see internal structure. 
and they're they're just seeds. <laughs> like they're just they're just seeds, uh, and they're actually pretty abundant. It's pretty neat. Well, seeds are one of those things. It makes sense that there are lots of situations where a seed would not fossilize because they're 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 organic and the ergo as far as deep time goes very delicate but there's also like a bajillion of them being produced all the time all the places just forever so your chances of them fossilizing make it should be pretty decent yeah statistically if you have a whole lot some of them have to preserve right so we have seeds at latest by the devonian by the late devonian seeds as we would call something a seed <laughs> What do we know about how seeds came to be, how, uh, about the evolution of seeds? There is so much about Paleozoic plants that I wish I knew. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to look it up, and I just kept getting, I, I went in lots of circles. It was very exciting. So basically, the impetus for seeds, the reason that seeds are going to be a good idea is, again, that terrestrialization. If you can move from spores to seeds, that gives you a lot more opportunity in terms of dispersal into drier environments. In order to do that, you need to do a couple of things. And honestly, the f in most places, the first step to that is heterospory. Going from having just a whole bunch of identical spores to heterospory where you have two different sizes you have the mega megaspores and the microspores you got the eggs and you got the sperm and once you do that then it's just kind of a the the dominoes kind of fall into place and you you kind of see this like tunnel into seed development so in order to kind of complete the transformation into being a seed plant you need to have the evolution of the integument. So again, that's kind of that envelope around the ovule that then forms the seed coat. Because if again, if you don't have that protective outside, you're not a very good seed. <laughs> and then you need something to receive the pollen. You need something to get the pollen to the egg, whatever that may be. And this decouples pollination from water. Once you can use something other than water to get the sperm to the egg, you can move much further away from water. So early seed plants and pre-seed plants produced ovules and pre-ovules in these cupules that were partially enclosed. So basically... It's the same thing we see with animals. You have these little changes that, oh, I can go further from the water now. Oh, I can go further from the water now. Oh, I can go even further from the water now. And those <laughs> three things, heterospory, evolution of the integument, and pollen receiving structures, is basically what you need to go from spores to seeds. All right. And then once those seeds are in place, you know, we're talking late Devonian. This, this transition is probably happening across the Devonian. And then, of course, the Carboniferous is famous, as we've talked about before, for being the time where you had the first really major plant-based ecosystems and biomes. You have your forests, which is an ecosystem regime that could not have happened without these steps towards terrestrialization, including not only like the vascularization, right, woody plants transporting nutrients, but also those this seed mechanism that allows reproduction to give rise to all these plants. Exactly. So you have, and even though when we think of the Carboniferous, you're probably thinking of the swamps. So you, you may be like, why would you need to get away from water? The water is right there. Yes, that's true. But that wasn't everything. So moving into the uplands, so way away from the water, was something that happened in the Carboniferous. And so we always think about those coal swamps, but there were other things happening too. And so we didn't have this real diversification of seeds in the Carboniferous. Plants may, maybe would not have made it to the Permian. Because, like, if the coal swamps are gone and that's where everybody is, that's the end of this, you know, kingdom. But because of terrestrialization, the evolution of the seed, they were able to get further from, you know, further from the water 
spread out across the supercontinent and then survive <laughs> when the worst happened. So we have had seeds proper on Earth for the last 350 million years or so. Mm -hmm. So moving forward and looking at this grand history of seeds, what is the fossil record of seeds like? So I have a snarky comment in my outline that says, Great. Like all plant fossils, better than you think. <laughs> <laughs> because again people tend to think oh there's just no plant fossils we don't know a thing like no no may I introduce you to petrified forest national park <laughs> but regardless like the whole point of seeds is to be resilient right the whole point of seeds is to survive in extreme conditions so yeah they're actually pretty common as as fossils there are a couple different types of preservation so you can get carbonization and impressions so basically if you were to just press a seed between pages of a book that's going to be an you know the mark that's left behind in that sort of situation that's an impression if any sort of organic is left behind that's going to be carbonization so you can get things like that in some environments but the real fun ones are the ones that are permineralized because mm -hmm then you get three-dimensional structures. And that's so cool. And when you're looking, when I was trying to look into the uh, fossil record of seeds, especially when you get into the Cenozoic and there are angiosperms to worry about, you're going to run into fruits too because seeds are inside of fruits. So if you have a fruit, you also have the seeds. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. not always, um, depending on the type of fruit that it is. But... You can get really phenomenal 3D preservation. And that's really, really, like, it's really cool, but it's really useful. But one of the downsides is that depending on the age of the material, depending on the type of preservation, it is, it can be very easy for, how do I put this nicely? Not paleobotanists to miss the seeds. Mm. <laughs> so the um, previous curator of paleobotany here at uh, Fort Hay State, his specialty was seeds, fossil seeds. And so I've had a couple of conversations with him about excavating and looking for seeds in the fossil record. And one of the problems that you run into is that the type of screen washing that is easiest if you are looking for like vertebrate material or invertebrate material isn't necessarily going to be conducive to finding seeds. And it depends, right. you know, it depends on the type of screen washing that you're doing and also the type of preservation. So the locality that he was working on, Minium Quarry, it is a late Miocene site in Kansas. It has absolutely fantastic preservation of fossil seeds. But if you screen wash it, if you wet screen it, they're gone. They are immediately just sandpaper gone, destroyed because they're very, they're grass seeds. They're very small. But if you do dry screening and you just like very slowly go through layer by layer without any water, you're more likely to actually find the seeds. It takes so much more work and so much more time, <laughs> but you'll find the seeds. So like that's, and this is true of most things in paleobotany, right? Like the things that are required to find fossil plant material is not what you need if you're looking for vertebrates. So if you don't have a paleobotanist to help you, you're just plowing through the important stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier in the episode, we were uh, we had related seeds to teeth, mm -hmm. and that is a comparison that kind of sticks in my mind because we talked in the teeth episode, episode eighty eight, about how teeth preserve really well in the fossil record because they're sturdy and they're really abundant. Mm -hmm. Most animals are producing lots of them, so there's lots of opportunity for teeth to become preserved. And they also have the added benefit of, in many cases, being really useful for paleontologists. The teeth can be very specific to the type of animal that you're studying. I think if you had asked me 10 years ago 
to think about plant fossils and what plant fossils are important, I probably would have said, you know, wood and leaves, right? Those are your plant fossils. But nowadays, especially knowing what I know about the research that's been done at the Gray Fossil Site, I have a much greater appreciation, not only for pollen, which we're not talking about in detail right now, <laughs> but for seeds as their, for their utility in identifying and recognizing fossil plants. Exactly. And so that is, I really appreciate you going through the next part of my outline for me. Sure. <laughs> it's like I, we wrote this episode. I, <laughs> I know. Like, I'm so impressed. <laughs> so you are entirely right. Like, depending on the questions that you are asking, you're going to look to different parts of the plant. So if you are interested in <sighs> environmental reconstructions or understanding the physiology of the plant, you're going to look at things like wood and leaves. But wood and leaves are terrible taxonomically. They're kind of the worst uh, taxonomically. Because right, for identifying particular species or genera or exactly. whatever level exactly. you want. Exactly. So I know that... So when I was working on uh, leaves for my dissertation, you know... I knew that the leaves that I had based on, you know, certain characteristics were from dicots, dicot angiosperms. They were probably trees. That seemed likely. And they were different shapes. And that was it. I don't know who they were. I numbered them. They, that's all. That's all. Because that's all I needed. Because I didn't, it didn't, <laughs> didn't matter who they were. I just needed to know these are different shapes. When you're talking about wood, same sort of thing. I, was, I feel like we may have made this comparison before, but this sounds like when croc teeth are found at a fossil site. And it's like, uh, it's a tooth, it's a cone, definitely croc. All right. Moving on. The next fossil we found was... <laughs> yep, exactly. And right, and it, then here's this little mammal tooth, and here's what species it is. Yes, specifically. Yes. We think it's new. Right. <laughs> exactly. So if you're looking at wood, you may be able to... Experts may be able to, not I... Experts are able to tell you generally what type of tree it is. So like the palm wood situation is very different from, say, an actual like angiosperm tree versus a gymnosperm tree. I can't tell the difference, but the wood people can. That's what I always refer to them at paleobotany conferences. They're really nice. They, they sell postcards. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... But if you really want to understand evolutionary relationships of different plants, you're going to need to look at basically reproductive parts. So you're going to want to look at the fruits, the flowers, and the seeds. If you can get those, you can really understand evolutionary relationships between different uh, groups of plants. So I, I literally include the gray fossil site as a prime yeah. example of this. Because I was going, so, so I was thinking back to the things that I knew when I was there during my master's and I like could immediately rattle off a couple of different studies that I knew that had been published that were about seeds. So I decided to go back through and see how many more there were and oh my goodness, y'all are doing great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've had about a dozen new species of plants identified at the Gray Fossil Site, and I think they've all been identified based on seeds. At least all the new ones. Or the, the recent ones, I should yeah, say. Yeah, the ones that I saw were based on, if not seeds, then fruit, which are, that's basically seeds. Right, right, right. Seeds and fruit. But it's really fascinating because, like, not only can you tell, like, oh, broadly speaking, it's a grape, but we can very specifically go in and be like, oh, because of this feature of this little bit here, specifically, it's related to things that are here today, which is not what you would expect based on what's present in, in East Tennessee. And that is utterly fascinating to me, because, it, but it does make sense because... The type of preservation that y'all have at Gray is not going to be, generally speaking, isn't going to be real good for leaves. <laughs> but you're looking at hard parts. Like, seeds are hard parts. Uh, hickory nuts are hard parts. So mm -hmm. those are the kinds of things that you may see preserved with vertebrates. In fact, 
the minium quarry that I was talking about before, the when they went to the site, this family had land. They're like, yeah, all these bones are weathering out. And they're like, these are rhinos. When they were looking at this, the bones up close, because there was a paleobotanist with them, he was like, those are seeds. <laughs> those are fossil seeds. And so a lot of the work that's come out of that uh, locality has actually been the paleobotany. But because... Like, because seeds are hard parts, you can get them preserved with bones, which is not always something that happens. Like, normally, I generalize and say that you're not going to find plants with with animals. And that's not entirely true. It depends on the part that you're looking for, because seeds, they're fine. It really is fascinating and awesome, the the parallels between teeth and seeds, because they're they're tough. They're built to be tough. Like, teeth need to be tough because they're chewing on stuff they're eating seeds eat. yeah exactly right? <laughs> yeah it's an arms race yes. between teeth and yes seeds. yes yeah and so they need to be <laughs> tough for the the job they're doing they are incredibly important to the life cycle and span and style of the organism they're associated with so they're very diagnostic you can learn a lot from them and they're both very charismatic like, yes. Yeah, they're that, very recognizable. They're recogni- like, th- this is a more superficial note, but like, when you display a fossil seed and a fossil tooth, people can go, yeah, that's a hickory nut. Awesome. Yeah. You know, a chunk of wood is much more ambiguous. Mm-hmm. Just like a, a, a piece of a limb bone can often be like, I promise you this is a chunk of an arm bone. I can see it. I know you can't. Which is a fun note for when we're talking about educating about fossils. Because I think when people think about fossil plants, the first thing, based on conversations I've had with people, visitors in the museum and whatnot, the first thing that often comes to mind is fossil wood. Yeah, petrified petrified wood. wood. Yes. But seeds and leaves are great because, yeah, you put that on display and you go, yeah, that's a leaf. Yeah. Same thing with a tooth. Mm-hmm. I'm often surprised at how well visitors to the museum are able to identify, even when it's like a mastodon tooth and it looks totally different from the teeth you're used to seeing people see it and go yeah that's a tooth yeah i know what a tooth looks like it's still got the fundamental parts and Mm so yeah seeds really do capture a lot of that same not only utility for the science but also for science outreach and, and and display a seed's a cool like objectively cool fossil to find because it's like that that's one of those moments where you pick it up and you're like, I know immediately exactly what I'm holding because mm-hmm. it's a seed because I've seen these in my backyard or at the grocery store and like I've seen something very similar to this uh, and it immediately c- connects you, which is that's cool. That's the thing I really like about plant fossils because with the exception of wood, because it it's kind of a paperweight. Let's be real. <laughs> Most other types of plant fossils are so so charismatic you look at that and you're like that's a leaf and it's it's really exciting for me because like i know that you are wonderful and you are actively interested in paleobotany but mostly we're ignored (laughs) so the fact that i could kind of counteract that with like no no but like look at this like look how beautiful (laughs) this leaf is it is aesthetically pleasing (laughs) <laughs> I think that helps. So we have a great diversity of seeds among modern day plants for us to study. We have a great record of seeds in the fossil record that tell us all sorts of stuff about seed history and plant lifestyles. Before we wrap up our look at seeds through time, just Allie, what can you tell us? What else is there to say about seed evolution? Are there any cool trends, patterns, stories regale us with something before we finish our discussion about seeds seeds are really cool like i just want to lead with that they're really cool like i had so much fun researching for this episode because like ah they're just amazing i knew i liked them i used to joke that i was a seed whisperer uh, when i was taking botany in undergrad because i was really good at identifying seeds but i digress (laughs) So one of the cool patterns that I saw when I was looking into this was the evolution of seed size. So during the Cretaceous, once angiosperms started to really diversify, 
they shifted from having primarily very small seeds to they just went ham. Like every kind of seed, we're going to make that. <laughs> so in general, the smaller the seed means the more seeds you can have per flower and vice versa. The bigger the seed, the fewer seeds that you can have per flower. But bigger seeds have an advantage in low light conditions. Oh. The reason for mm. that is the bigger the seed, the more food there is. So if you are starting with more food, you can survive if you can't make it with light immediately. So, Neat. right? Like it makes a lot of, once I read that, I was like, oh yeah, no kidding. That makes perfect sense. So today, angiosperm seeds range in mass across 11 orders of magnitude. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell us the extremes of that scale. Of of course I will. <laughs> so the smallest seed, do you want to guess? Do you want to guess what the smallest angiosperm seed is? Is it a type of orchid? It is. It's orchid. I did it. I, learned, I listened to episode 125. Hey. <laughs> We've also mentioned it multiple times already in this episode. But, you know, you're listening. Right. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, yes. Dust-like, lint-like, teeny tiny little seeds. The largest seed is the coco de mer or the double coconut. They weigh double coconut, right? <laughs> Super coconut. They are honking huge. It's a coconut with the strength of two coconuts. <laughs> you're, you're not ready for the numbers I'm about to say. <laughs> they weigh 20 kilos, which is 44 pounds. Whoa, that's too much. <laughs> I told you you weren't prepared. But why? That no light. <laughs> <laughs> These. He's grown in the depths of caves. You, th <laughs> you think the darkness is your ally. <laughs> I was born in it. Um, yeah, so, like, hedgesperms, do not mess around when it comes to seeds. Wow. So, gymnosperms did not go quite as hard <laughs> as hedgesperms, because it's like, that's hard to match, right? Like, that's hard to match. But, on average, the average gymnosperm seed is larger than the average angiosperm seed. Really? I mean, you got a huge range, right? But yes. So they have less variation in mass, though. So today, the seed masses of gymnosperms only span eight orders of magnitude. No, they're really slacking. Yeah. Are right? you even trying? I know. I know. <laughs> Where's your double pine cone? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um have okay, have you ever seen Oh, what? Oh, who is it? It's not the redwood. It's another coastal pine that has cones that are like the size of babies. <laughs> They're like this big. So like that's what? 18 inches. It's like the width of my shoulders. Is this pine cone, right? It is the wow. size of a baby. And every time I see one, I think that could kill someone. Yeah. Yeah. See, I grew up in a, a house that was, the, the backyard was full of pine trees. So the yard would just become like covered in pine cones. Mm -hmm. And one of my chores was to clean them up. And now I'm picturing having to like get a baseball mitt to just grab these <laughs> football sized pine cones and lug yes. five of them into the trash can <laughs> and then dump it to like five more in. Ugh. But to be fair, the cone only holds the seeds. The seeds are itty bitty inside, but still, right. <laughs> but still. That's a lot of seeds. So we're compensating. <laughs> it's a lot of seeds. So the other thing that's really neat, that makes sense, but I didn't think about it until I read it. It was like, yeah, nope, obviously. Plant size is correlated with seed mass. Interesting. And it is a stronger correlation than mode of dispersal or environmental conditions. Really? Weird. Which is not what I would have expected. I would have expected yeah. that, like, you know getting this moving around this seed or getting it to actually germinate would be the number one driver of side but no plant size determines seed size i mean I, like I, that's a trend in animals i was gonna say so, yeah animals generally especially mammals well i was gonna say egg size yeah yeah that's true, correlates true. with animal side that the bigger animals the bigger egg because you have to grow a bigger baby yes mammals that's 
the correlation holds just without the egg part most yeah, of the time. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so I mean, it, it's not that shocking. It's just I I wouldn't have thought it mattered when you weren't having to like carry your babies inside you. Right. You don't need. You don't have a baby tree. Yeah. In the seed. So like, huh? Allie's but, making faces at us. I am. But but <laughs> the the plant still has to hold on to the seed before it drops. Yeah. So yeah. small plants. A dandelion can't hold a coconut. <laughs> okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Exactly, it makes a whole lot of sense. I just hadn't really thought about yeah. it. Yeah, well, we're stuck thinking about the after the seed is released yes. part. Yes, exactly. But no, that makes sense. A big animal, that makes sense. A little animal can't lay a big egg. Yes. Unless you're a kiwi. I was thinking case. that exact thing. Yeah. <laughs> but generally speaking, yes, yes. you cannot... And if you're not an ostrich, you're not laying an ostrich size egg. Yes. Exactly. And the same is apparently true of plants. The other <laughs> thing that correlates with seed size is genome size. Ooh. Really? Yeah. The bigger the genome, in general, the bigger the seed. I I really hope you're not going to tell us that it's because they literally have to make room for... Oh, it's just full. The well, DNA. I mean, you're kind of, that's kind of it. So they, larger, <laughs> so larger genomes tend to have larger cells. And that's what a, like, that's what this is, right? It's the, the bigger, yeah. the, the bigger the cell, the bigger the seed is going to have to be. And they have uh, slower cell division rates. But yeah, basically, they just got to fit that genome in there. We have too much DNA yeah. for a puny cell. Also, well, and this, we don't have to go into details here, but of course, plants are famous uh-huh. Or things like whole genome duplication. Yep. So when we say bigger genomes, we don't mean like... One or two. With animals where it's like, yeah, this is five or ten usually percent difference in size. It's like, yeah, this plant has four times the genome as this other plant. Because the genome was duplicated several yes. times. Yeah, plants go hard. Plants yes. do <laughs> not mess around. They play on hard mode. Well, and that's another scenario of like... Yeah, makes perfect sense because DNA is a physical thing that mm-hmm. takes up space. Right, it's not just ones and zeros. Yeah. <laughs> but s- never, ever any other time do we have to consider how much space the DNA takes up because it doesn't matter in almost any other conversation except for plants, evidently. Yep. <laughs> Weird. Isn't it cool? It, that's so cool. Very that's, cool. That's awesomely bizarre. So the last thing I want to talk about, again, only in brief, is convergence. Oh, please do. I I would love to. <laughs> so dispersal is full of convergence because in many instances, there's just a one shape that's really good for a particular type of dispersal. So for example, like I mentioned, both gymnosperms and angiosperms have fleshy coverings to their seeds and they are fundamentally different (laughs) right so convergent evolution as we've discussed many many times we discussed this a bunch last episode in 134 yep independent groups of life separately evolving very similar traits for similar purposes exactly because you know being torpedo shape is great if you're trying to go through the water Mm -hmm. and if you want something to eat you make yourself tasty (laughs) And there are certain things that animals just really like to eat. Yep. This this is true. Speaking of tasty gifts, remember when we talked about uh, Mermecacori with uh, ants and giving the ants gifts? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. This gets so much cooler. So I talked about how they have the eleosome, that gift that they give to the ants. Like, here, eat this and then take me with you. So there was a study that came out in 2010 that was trying to see if there was convergence in this. They found that uh, Myrmecacori is present in at least 11,000 species of angiosperms, which is 4.5% of angiosperm species. It was present in 334 genera, which is 2.5% of all genera known, and 77 families, which is 17% of angiosperm families. Wow. You know, it's (laughs) funny because 
I think one impulse in response to those ridiculous numbers might be to say something wonderful and awe-inspiring about plants, but my gut reaction is to go, man, ants. <laughs> ants are everywhere. That's ants true. have just made themselves utterly yeah. unavoidable. Es- they are essential. Ants are inevitable. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. You can't avoid them, and they're super useful yes. all over the place. Man. So. That's insanity. Oh, it gets better. So, there are... How many? Ooh. How many independent origins of Myrmecacori do you think there are? It's found in 11,000 uh, species. And, and 11, 70, 77 families, 77 did you say? 77 families. Oh, uh, let's say 30. 11,000. Great. It's, it's, <laughs> it's between those two numbers. Okay, we did it. Hey. Good work. So... Conservatively, it's at least 101 times. Wow. And up to 147 times. So I was closest without going over. Yeah, you were. (laughs) That's ridiculous. And, and there are 13 families that did it at least three times. Each? Each. That's preposterous yeah at least it. three could be more than three minimum of three like uh, the, the the lesson here is that the path to success is to make friends with ants yep this is true uh it is interesting though when you look at the distribution a lot of these plants are in australia really yeah huh. yeah that's yeah. even weirder to me because i was kind of automatically imagining that this had just shown up in all different places all over the world yeah the fact that it evolved perhaps dozens and dozens of times on one landmass is really interesting. Yeah, it's all over the place, but a lot of them are in Australia. And I wonder if it's because there's not much to eat there. So, you know, we'll recruit the ants. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, if it, yeah, because if anyone's going to make a, a comfortable home in the outback, it's going to be ants. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, one last thing I wanted to talk about in terms of convergence. So, cereal grains. So, that's going to be your wheat and your barley and all those sort of oats. Cereal grains. The things your cereal is made out of. The things you bake with. The things we've domesticated out the wazoo. Yes, those. They're monocots. They are specifically grasses. They are in the family Poaceae. They are convergent with pseudo-cereals. Which are die cuts that are basically the same. These are the ones you get in the bags. <laughs> the off brand cereals. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Kroger brand grass. Oh, that's exactly what it is. So uh, you have, and they're die cuts. So you have quinoa, which is in Amaranthaceae. It's a die cut, but like we treat it like a grain. And also buckwheat. I didn't realize buckwheat wasn't actually a grain. It's uh, an entirely different family. It's in uh, Polygonaceae. But yeah, like, you got, like, I shouldn't be surprised by this, but I did find that very surprising that, like, oh, yeah, just everybody wants to be a grain. I mean, you get a free ride on the Domestication Express. Oh, yeah. This is true. Like, we're going to send you everywhere. If you aren't going to befriend the ants. (laughs) <laughs> that, yeah, that's the next best thing. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, moral of the story is uh, seeds are super cool. They really are. Partially just because of what they're doing, like the job of protecting baby plant and nurturing baby plant so that it can it can become a plant. But also the, the crazy diversity of ways they do that, of extra steps that have been added on to, like extra coatings extra features and structures it's it's tons to study and learn but also it, at least for me it has always been one of the most interesting parts of plants like just it's what you find on the ground you know that have fallen from plants and stuff so you can as a kid i used to collect acorns like they're just they're neat through and through well seeds has the, the similar quality as some of the other subjects we've talked about and we've brought up teeth from episode 88 and eggs from episode 92 that these are structures that evolved very early on and have 
followed the evolutionary history of their respective groups and diversified in so many ways that now not only are they everywhere, but they are a fundamental part of what it means to be that type of organism. Okay. Seeds are a part of what it means to be a plant for most plants, just like eggs are a fundamental mm -hmm. part of what it means to be an animal for most animals. To understand seeds, to study seeds, and to get an idea of the history of the evolutionary past of seeds is to understand plants and thus the world all around us, which is built upon the, uh, if I may, the fruits mm -hmm. of these structures that are so important to plant diversity. Yeah, exactly. And I mean... I had to start this conversation literally by like, okay, crash course and what it means to be a plant. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. yep. They are fundamental to seed plants, which is honestly the bulk of the diversity of plants through much of time, especially today. So yeah, like seeds are charismatic and they are pretty fundamental to relating to plants, I think, because, you know, seeds are probably one of the most common ways that we directly interact with plants. If you are going to, you're, you're going to grow a plant, you're going to plant some seeds. You will be eating seeds or you're eating the fruit that is protecting the seeds. Like seeds are pretty essential to just being a human. Yeah. yeah we got a bunch of seeds in the fridge downstairs. Yep. 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 Well, and like there's also whole habitats and, and ecosystems that are in many ways driven by seeds you know uh, uh the acorns that fall and are going to make sure you have squirrels after winter like there's there's whole food webs that rely on this plant structure and their dispersal and the fact that more are made than will survive and so it's just it's like we were saying how the fact that so many plants have partnered with ants is a testament to ants but also so many things rely on seeds. Mm -hmm. Yes. So many animals just that is their go-to food source. And that's really, really impressive. So, for example, did you know that the Dutch word for squirrel is acorn? Ha! Huh. huh. Which I find very funny, but... I love it. Yeah, fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> I want to name other things off of what they eat. Well, Allie, thank you so much for giving us this brief tour of what it means and what it has meant to be a seed. We are not done talking about plants for this episode because there is one more thing for us to do. As longtime listeners know, we have a Patreon. We do. And one of the gifts that our supporters on Patreon... Allie knows. Allie's on there. I am. One of the gifts that supporters on Patreon can get in return for supporting us is the opportunity to submit questions for us to answer on the podcast in a segment we call the patron question every now and then we get patron questions about plants yeah. plant related questions which are great for saving for episodes like this when Allie's around to answer these questions this episode our patron question comes from dawn who asks is it possible to tell the size of a prehistoric plant You've talked previously about how pollen is often used as an identifier, and in this episode, we have now spoken about how seeds are often used for identifying. How, asks Don, if at all, can size estimates be done from something that small? Is there any other way to get these estimates? I love this question. All right, so short answer. Sometimes. Don't worry, <laughs> I'll elaborate. So... I looked into it because I was curious if there was any way to like, if there was any relationship between like pollen size and plant size. And as far as I could tell, no. But if you are working with particularly younger material, you might actually be able to estimate like, well, it was old enough to make pollen. And today this group makes uh, trees that are this big. So the plant is probably this big. Uh, but that's really imprecise and kind of a, a you know quick and dirty sort of way of doing it. There, again, there is a relationship between seed size and plant size. Again, this is kind of quick and dirty. If you have a big seed, you kind of have to have a big plant because you'll have like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree situation otherwise, where yes. just the seed is weighing <laughs> down the plant. But there are ways to do much more 
direct reconstructions of plant size. So, you know, when you're looking at really old material, so like rhiny chert, really old plants, they're small enough that the whole thing gets preserved. We know exactly how big this plant was because we have the whole thing preserved. And sometimes you will get that with more recent material if you have a smaller plant that gets preserved as an impression in like a shale or something like you might know hey we got everything it was this big when you're talking about woody plants so plants that make wood um have the secondary growth there are actually a couple of different ways that you can estimate plant size which is so cool to me so there is The best way to do it is by looking at the girth of the tree. So the diameter of the trunk or the stem, you know, you can do it with both. So there was a paper that came out in the early nineties, but like, it's super cool that they looked at herbaceous plants. So those are basically plants that are not woody. So like grasses and things like that. Um, And vines and palms and gymnosperms and angiosperms. And basically try to make a metric for looking at the diameter of the stem and reconstructing the size of the plant. And it's really neat. That's something that you can do. So if you are able to measure this, the diameter, you can reconstruct the size of the plant. Another way that you can do it is combining with context clues. So if you have the diameter so you can figure out the size you know that's neat but if you can also look at the diameter and then proximity to other stumps something like that so this is something that was done on Rasinga, uh one of the field sites that i worked at so this is an early miocene site in western kenya so an island in uh lake victoria one of the things that <laughs> this is just so cool to me um there are in c2 st- stumps so what that means is These are tree trunks with roots in life position. So they're able to look at the size of these trunks and their proximity to each other to estimate the kind of canopy structure that there was in this forest during the early Miocene, like 18 million years ago, which is really neat. So basically the easiest way to do it is if you, if you have the trunk, because if you think about it, the size of the trunk is going to have to be proportionate to the size of the plant that's holding up. Otherwise, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Yeah, I can't think of anything else that's going to be that helpful. But yeah, if you got the trunk, you're good to go. Very mm-hmm. cool. That's really good to know. We run into similar issues when we talk about animal stuff. And once again, one more time, <laughs> I'll bring up teeth and eggs. <laughs> Often a very similar situation. It's yes. hard to know just from a tooth the size of the animal, but it's not. Im- you can get some estimates. Yeah. Similar with eggs, there is a rough correlation. I had known about the idea of measuring the diameter of a stem and a trunk. That makes sense. And I I would imagine that even if you only have part of the outer wood, based on the curvature of it, you could get an estimate of the the full size. Vaguely circles. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But I had never thought about correlating the size of seeds or the spacing between your plant remains that's 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 very interesting that's my favorite finding the spacing of the trunks yeah to give you an idea of what was the spread of your branches and the spread of your canopy that's very cool like plants are great for time travel (laughs) y'all they sure are (laughs) well thank you don for asking that question thank you as always to all of our patrons thank you to all of our listeners for listening through this discussion about seeds and then a little bit extra plant stuff right there at the end Thank you to those who requested this episode topic. And of course, a huge thanks to Allie for joining us once again. I love this. I look forward to it. <laughs> we love having you around. We get to learn a bunch of stuff. We don't have to do any research. It's great. It's just it's just the best. <laughs> we, you should just do every episode of the podcast. <laughs> 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 all plants all the time from now on. Well, it's about time for us to wrap up this episode. So again, thanks to everyone for listening. If you have subjects in mind you'd like us to do for episodes, go ahead and submit requests. We are always taking requests, social media, email, on our new Discord server, however you want to get a, uh, reach out to us. Don't forget all the other ways you can engage with our podcast. You can buy our cool new merch on our Zazzle store with our new art from Rob and Anna. Yup. You can, of course, subscribe to us on Patreon to give us financial support in addition to the moral support that comes with having people giving us money on Patreon. 
And of course, you can keep listening and tell your friends to do the same. We release episodes every fortnight. We will be back in a fortnight with episode 136, which will not be about plants. No, it won't. Sorry, Allie. So if you only listen to us for plant-related subjects, please check back in about six months Mm -hmm. for episode 145, when Allie will be back to talk more about plant things with us. In the meantime, enjoy the start of spring. Allie, have a happy birthday. Yay! Thank you. (laughs) Thanks one more time for joining us. We'll see everybody next time. We'll seed everybody next time. Seed everybody next time. No, 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 no. no. That, that's not great. That's that's a little inappropriate. Seed you later. There you go. Sure. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to the Common Descent podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.